हेलो स्टूडेंट्स हाय वेलकम टू द साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी रैपिड रिविजन सीरीज व्हिच इज देयर बिफोर आई गो इनटू द रिविजन पार्ट आई वांट टू टेल यू अ फ्यू थिंग्स सो दैट इट बिकम्स क्वाइट क्लियर टू यू एज टू व्हाट वी आर ट्राइंग टू डू ओवर हियर I don't find a lot of you who ask me to cover the basics. So then <laughs> I'm going to catch them over here because in the previous class, when when I took environment, I had asked specifically as to is there anything that is you know you needed specifically in the S N T class, not the topics but the areas. But I don't see any of them here. Let's hope they'll come. Yeah, you are there. Okay. Ha. Huh. Uh, now see. Okay. First of all, class is divided into two parts today and tomorrow. Uh, the division will be based on what or what area is extremely important for UPSC and in a relative order of decreasing importance. I've done that in that manner so that you also take a clue from it and design your revision or any other extra revision that you do based like that. So today's class will be based on public health. biotechnology general science biology part got it now the reason why we are going into detail about this part you all know if you've seen the past upsc papers take 2020 21 any of these things things might go on getting shuffled like you might have as one person observed over here you might have technology based questions but something that remains constant throughout is this area wherein now upsc has leveled up to an extent where they have left normal questions they've gone into depth now to appreciate or to even solve those in depth questions you require strong basics got it so you cannot if someone is going to ask you a very detailed question on transcriptome and pan transcriptome if you don't know what rna is you will not ever solve that question for you it will seem like greek you will just be like yeah, no <laughs> transcriptome and all is out of my league i am leaving it there okay this is the first point second thing is so my class this particular class i am focusing clearly on these patterns and i have given more importance to public health biotech bio in the first class tomorrow we'll be covering all your other parts space communication technology nuclear technology all of these things will be covered tomorrow and your basics is covered in a selective manner when i'm saying selective manner what i mean is i will not be teaching you india's three stage nuclear program got it because you don't either you don't have to have extensive information i just touch and go okay india has a three stage nuclear program these are the different parts of it but i will not be telling you okay this is a nuclear reactor this is coolant this is graphite rod i will not be teaching you in that manner primarily because the basics of that area is not important but you will notice in the biotech class i will start from cell organelles etc because that part is important so selectively i have taken up basics okay then the chief important part of this class is your current affairs okay so i was just telling the students now on camera i cannot tell you all the sources i have referred but i have gone through four to five different current affair materials existing at this point along with my current affair notes picked up the most important ones and the most probable ones and that is what will be part of your slides clear so if i am not discussing and again someone was here so ma'am i'll do your slides and then i'll go read current affair no you do my slides and that's it you don't go and read a current affair material after this one because you don't have time if you have the luxury of time you can do it i don't mind <laughs> but as an ideal upsc aspirant you shouldn't be having much time at this point so don't go read any other current affair material after this the point is your current affairs will get sorted in these two classes is that clear okay so with that let's start the class quickly uh, one more thing uh, the breaks of this class will be from you can note it down at this point itself so that you don't ask me in between we'll have the first break at 11:30 the break will be for 15 minutes 11:30 to 11:45 and after that the next break will be from 130 i am looking at 2 but i am pretty sure you guys will make it 210 to 15 and not but formally it's still 130 to 2 that's your lunch break okay so that we can wrap the class around 430 that's it clear 
okay so the first area that we are going into is our star area biotechnology yeah come <laughs> Are there more of you yet to come? Please tell me that because I don't want to be dealing with DNA in middle and someone coming and asking me, ma'am, what is cell? I'm starting anyway. Others have to watch the YouTube video to get the first part. Okay. When we talk about biotechnology, the first basic start from the concept of cell. Okay. Now, before I go into the concept of cell, you know every other living organism will have some kind of structuring in this manner it's called a cell broadly based on cell structure based on the different kinds of components in the cell you can divide cells based on the organisms that is there like for example plant and animal cell you can also have another division which is called as eukaryotes and prokaryotes first we'll deal with the concept of plant and animal cell uh, the question potential of this area comes from the fact these two pictures have a good look at these two pictures okay you have primarily this is the plant cell that is your animal cell okay notable differences are there from the cell picture itself so you have to focus on what are the clear differences between these two cells that is your question area first of all you see the plant cell had a good shape quite in form very fit why because it has the cell wall the cell wall which is made of cellulose gives the rigid structure that is there in the case of a plant cell so when i'm saying plant cell do i expect the same kind of structure for even bacterial cells okay we have plant, we have animal, then we have few others, which is virus, bacteria, algae, fungi. Algae is a, algae belongs to or algae will have some similarity with any of plant or animal, plants. Bacteria, what about bacteria? Okay, say clearly, because in your other classroom, I used to hear your comments. I cannot hear anything that is happening at the back. Can you tell me what you just said? Guys, bacteria also has very similar structure like your plant cell, which means bacteria has a cell wall. Now I'm saying don't generalize this statement and say all bacteria have cell wall. No. Okay. A large majority of the bacteria has a cell wall oriented structure. Why am I so uh, obsessed with the cell wall of bacteria? It's because when we later on study certain drugs and certain things that can actually kill bacteria, what they try to do over there is they stop the bacteria from making the cell wall. Got it? This is the important part because if you stop the bacteria from making the cell wall, it will not, it cannot have all these things floating here and there, right? So this drug impedes that cell wall formation. This is the point you have to take. Bacteria also has in most of the cases. Now, obviously the world is large and huge. So you'll have some bacteria out there, which is not having a cell wall, but a large majority of the bacteria has a cell wall oriented structure. So cell wall is the first part. Next thing, if you look at the diagram, you see this large structure over here, vacuole. Now, again, the difference comes in the fact that the plant cell has this huge, large size vacuole. But in comparison, can you see the vacuole over here in the animal cell? Animal cell has so many other components that we are like, we don't have space for vacuole and all. If you want, we'll have some small, small, tiny parts. It's not even clearly visible over here. But if you want to know, we do have vacuoles. That is the point I want you to take over there. Animal cell has vacuoles, just that the size is smaller and not as large as the plant cell. Clear? Okay. So that is the second difference. The third difference, primarily if you look at it, this is quite green in color and all that. Now, why is that? Your plant cell has something called as plastids. And primarily the plastids are things called as the green thing is given, green color is given by a chloroplast. Animals do not have such kind of plastids. So now, for example, you have chloroplasts. 
for plants that are not green you have something called as chromoplasts then in some plants where your fats are stored you have something called as oligoplasts but animals are like no no we don't have need plastids and all that we have other mechanisms so animal cell you do not find plastids that is the third difference okay but so cell wall vacuole plastids next thing comes as two things centrosomes lysosomes let's deal with centrosomes first in when our cells have to divide okay we will not be going into cell division and everything but our cells constantly divide animal cells when they have to divide there is some processes that have to happen in middle which actually aids the splitting of the cell now the cell has to split it needs certain kind of structures over there called as centrosomes okay so your animal cell has centrosomes your plant cells do not have centrosomes now again centrosomes centrioles all of these things associated with cell division is absent in the kind of animals uh, in the kind of plant cells because plant cells divide by various other methods don't have to go into it understand centrosomes are absent in plants present in animals similar to like i told you vacuoles your plant has very large in size animals have small in size lysosome is that thing which animal cells have very much abundant here and there but plants do not have it much abundantly what is lysosome what is a lysosome suicide bags of the cell whenever the cell is dying or infected or if the cell at least feels like you know okay fine i'm done with my life at this point this bag of enzymes breaks open and it engulfs the entire cell thereby killing the cell so you have lysosomes again in your animal cells a lot but not so much there in your plant cells Think here it's all fine, I guess. Now coming into the crux of why we have to, you know, the biotechnology part, the genetic material. Uh, first thing, animals or plants, the genetic material is stored at certain parts in the cell. Okay, so let's take the animal cell first. Where do you think is the genetic material stored? Which organelles? Yes. Nucleus, obviously, and mitochondria. okay so in the animal cells genetic material is stored in nucleus and your mitochondria now almost 99 percentage of the genetic material is in the nucleus one percentage and even less than one percentage is what is there in the mitochondria now similar to that in the plant cells where all are they stored in the plant cells also in two particular organelles you have your genetic material stored where nucleus is the first obvious answer because you have that nucleus there where else uh, this is a revision class guys you are not i'm not teaching you from the beginning you have to answer all this quick chloroplasts in your chloroplasts you have again the same function that happens over there in the case of the mitochondria and nucleus where there is a division of almost 99% and 1% here there is a division between chloroplasts and your nucleus so your chloroplasts will again have 1% or less genetic material your nucleus will have almost the rest part of it clear so this cover some basic info now coming into the next kind of division called as prokaryotic and eukaryotic what is the difference between pro and eukaryotic this is the wrong definition this is what every class now understand this this is something that we have uh, fixed in our mind somehow you have to break that idea right now prokaryotes and eukaryotes are not single celled and multi celled that is not the division between them the division between them is the nuclear membrane that exists got it so which means in the case of the prokaryotes you have a defined nuclear region the membrane bound organelles which are there could be absent so for example if you take a prokaryotic cell 
in that you will have nuclear membrane and in the organelles which are there for example if you take the animal cell you had so many things you had lysosomes you had centrioles all of them also have an individual covering in the prokaryotes nothing is there you have a nuclear membrane that's it but membrane bound cell organelles are absent in the eukaryotes what happens is you have both the nuclear membrane as well as membrane enclosed organelles got it this is the primary difference not it just so happens that a lot of prokaryotes turned out to be single celled got it so it is not the defining feature the defining feature is the nuclear membrane and the nuclear membrane bound cell organelles is it person at the back is it clear you are take, putting so much of effort to even see the board you can come somewhere in the front if you want okay how are you guys sitting in this class is it cold there or is it only hot for me here guys okay, good nice coming to the core part which is your nucleus now in the nucleus this is the normal structure which is there you have certain structures on it called as nuclear pores you have an entire circle around it called as nuclear envelope now we have to go into the detail of it this exact way is how you have to understand this thing okay now a lot of students have seen getting confused between dna and gene okay let's start off first you have the nucleus inside the nucleus we generally said we have the genetic material so now what is your genetic material so the genetic material is primarily stored in these structures called as chromosomes this is what a chromosome looks like now you take one strand or one part of the chromosome and you try to enlarge it and see there you cons constantly find this kind of structure called as a double helix model dna So you have a DNA over there. So then, what is gene? Until you know, now, it's all there. There's nucleus, there's chromosome, there's DNA from it. Then, what is gene? Intermediate parts. Huh? Hereditary okay. So hereditary material is also DNA. Also, we keep saying that. What is exactly gene then? Okay. Again, get your concept very clear over here. you see this dna which is in the structure now this is there in all of our cells right which means technically and this is a fact you have to get into your mind technically almost 98 percentage of our genetic material is all the same the reason why we all seem different or look different is because of that 1 to 2 percentage difference in our genetic material So then, what exactly is this difference in the genetic material? And the fact over here is, you can have this entire DNA, but not all of that DNA is functional. You have specific areas in the DNA which are functional. Now, the reason why they are functional is what he said. There is something called as base pairs over there, and these base pairs just get combined in a manner so that it does some work over there. and those specific functional parts are your gene got it so your entire dna we can call as a hereditary material or anything but your genetic material is that specific functional part that determines the difference between each one of us okay so how does this become Oh, quickly let's go to the because uh, no class of biotechnology is complete without talking about the base pairs and all these structures so if you look at the two pictures over here there is dna there is rna first let's look into what we are familiar with which is your dna so you have a double helix model wherein you have two parts which we call as base pairs in total we have four base components which are there you have cytosin guanin adenine thymine there's a clear pairing over here adenine pairs with thymine guanin pairs with cytosin okay so you they are like friends forever wherever you see a thymine you will see an adenine over there wherever you see a guanin you see a cytosin over there 
keep this in your mind because if we ever want to tamper with the cell or with this genetic material all you have to do is there is a gonin now the gonin is going on looking for the cytosin instead of the cytosin you take the cytosin away and you put a thymine or any of the other ones over there cell will be like what what has happened right now where is my gonin i have to pair with and because of that that entire code will be non functional because the code will be functional only when the right pairs match with each other okay what happened sorted okay so this is your base pairs now your rna don't have two helixes and all but still rna is like i have only single strand but i do have certain things similar cytosine guanine adenine are similar the difference is uracil now the structuring of this is important and get this very clear in your mind because i would say in the last 5 years if you take two to three questions of your biotech can be solved just by understanding the application of these structures you see there is an rna over there which clearly has something very new called as uracil rna doesn't know about thymine dna has these pairings which means that if i want to ever have a new organism which is there for example there are two uh, things a and b organism which is there now if i want to create a third combined organism between them i always have to ensure at least both of them have the same genetic material got it so i cannot take some organism which has rna as a genetic material and an other organism which has dna as a genetic material and just be like okay fine now make one new one that is not possible why because rna clearly has uracil what will uracil go and pair with over there in the case of a dna so understand this when they keep asking you in depth questions like can virus and virus create genetic modified organism can bacteria and bacteria create all you have to see is is the bacteria and the bacteria having same kind of genetic material then you can combine them so you cannot combine two organisms which have two drastically different genetic material so can i ask you can plant and animals be combined and you have to tell me what new genetic material you found in plants plant has dna animal has dna in fact all your genetically modified crops genetically modified insulin how did all that come from plant and animal combination just keep this in mind this is the th point you have to keep in mind same genetic material when they have same genetic material you can combine it now the first important thing recombinant dna technology now before i go into that topic i wanted to be familiar with some terms over here because we just discussed the dna i told you the dna has base pairs and i talked to you about something called as gene so what actually happens over there see we all have dna but not all the features in our dna get expressed it gets expressed when you have specific functional codes now you the point being your body knows how to recognize these codes i'll tell you how so for example suppose this is a code it's nothing don't by heart or anything it's just a random code okay now what happens is you have this code that is there in your dna now i told you so much of dna it's like this huge like the magician does this trick this ribbon and ribbon coming out from there but to identify which are the codable parts you will have certain markers at the beginning of the code how will you find these markers that again you don't have to bother the cell will find all that okay now based on these markers what happens is 
so the cell every time think of it like going into a library and looking at all your bookshelf so you're looking for a very specific book on battle of plassey okay and the librarian has told you this is on that shelf so what will you do you will not go straight to the shelf like some psychopath and be like okay fine battle of plassey you will be going and you will be checking out all the shelf like okay useless 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 is oh fine battle of plassey similarly so your cell is reading through this entire code be like okay useless 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 oh fine something useful at this particular point the cell is like there is a important code that we have detected now this code is in your dna from that dna it will not be like okay code is detected this is going to get activated what happens is something gets activated and that is your initiation to create something called as mrna okay so mrna is the star this year mrna vaccine mrna that mrna silencing every other biotech current affair if you look you have mrna so you have to know about what mrna is consider mrna as that messenger that comes before your actual rna over here why because in our dna this is all in a double helix this is a very stable structure you will have the code over there but the code will remain as it is why because this is a very stable structure it's all fixed together which means you have to somehow break it to break this and split it and you have to split it when you normally know like okay if you have to split something you will require some enzymes that are enzymes are given over there and then what comes out of it you will create a single strand and what is similar to a single strand your rna so this dna will eventually create an rna strand which is there but before the rna strand is created you there is a technical problem over here right what is the technical problem because the dna has adenine thymine guanine cytosine rna needs what uracil so at this particular point you will take the dna code split it look at okay they are like okay adenine thymine guanine cytosine and then in this messenger rna process this thing undergoes a change and you will have the code of which has the uracil so what happens over here is suppose and this is very important ideally you need to get a code so thymine is will have to get replaced by uracil now to just take an example this code is for black hair okay the code for black hair would maybe be u c g okay the code that this rna should express is u c g if u c g is there is where you will look at right this person will have or the black hair or the keratin in that thing will be there now if i need to see u c g or get u c g you have to understand this messenger rna over there is like see we need u c g so messenger rna will not be making u c g messenger rna will be making similar to this what is the complementary code over here so for example instead of g it will have a c instead of c it will have a g instead of u again you will have the a so messenger rna will create the complementary one and messenger rna will be working see anyone has a match for this anyone has a match for this at this point another enzyme when in the fact when the messenger rna comes itself the entire cell will be like oh fine so much of happiness messenger rna has come at this point they are like okay this is coding for this let's create the complementary code and thus is where this rna strand will have u c g so understand you had dna which had all this over there from there an mrna got created the mrna initiated the process got a rna strand doesn't end there from this rna strand so until this what we have said the process is called as transcription okay the dna got transcribed into rna now from the rna stage it will get translated into a protein got it so this ucg 
will code for a specific protein. Now let's name the protein X. When that protein gets expressed in our body is where we end up with black hair. Got it. So take a moment, look at this entire process. Your entire biotechnology current affair and entire biotechnology static part is based on the fact that at what all stages can I make changes so that I can have a new product? What all changes, stages I can make a change so that something bad is not expressed or something good is added into this thing? So you can create changes at the DNA level at the mRNA level, at the RNA level. At any of these stages when you create, you can create changes in the protein. Now, at times, we've done all this. Okay, we have not, we, we've let the DNA be as it is, mRNA be as it is, RNA be as it is. The protein has got out. Now, at this part, at that protein stage also, I can create changes so that the protein is not expressed in our body. Got it? So, any technique I am going to now discuss with you is based on the changes that we are making at each of these levels. Some of these changes happen at the DNA level, some of these changes happen at the RNA level. Clear? Till here? Is this, uh, are you, do you all know these concepts and are you confidently sitting or I am trying to figure out what is the pace that is needed? Am I going too slow is the question. Yes. Say, open your mouth. Say, I'm getting increasingly this heat is making me quite irritable. So if you don't give me answers, uh, are you all following the class? Am I taking it too slow? Huh? What? Is it too slow? Yeah, it is too slow. Okay. What about you guys? Huh? Okay. Yes. Okay. This is way more cooler in this side of the class. I constantly come and ask you questions there is what I am thinking. Those who are finding it, those who are finding it uh, I had told them this that I it will be too hot over here, but then they were like, no, 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 it will be fine. Okay, uh, so yeah, those who are finding it slow at this point, I it's either because you know these concepts in detail, but I do feel a large majority of you need clarity in these concepts because that is what I am understanding. So bear with me if the pace is slow at this point because at least for the benefit of the uh, entire class we have to go into the basics of this because I don't want to be dealing with the current affair and you guys getting confused as to these particular concepts. Got it? So if I am too slow just bear with me um, at least in the beginning of this part. Now the concepts so for the first one we have to study is your recombinant DNA technology. Recombinant DNA technology is from the word itself, it gets clear, you are combining something. Okay. Now what are the two major processes involved over there? You are cutting or isolating a segment of the DNA and joining or transferring this DNA or gene with the other organism. So recombinant DNA technology in the first place itself understand, here you have one organism's DNA which is taken and another one which is having some particular code. Now you will not be replacing the entire DNA, you just need one specific code. So what happens, you will take another organism, find out that code. Now for example, if it's a plant which is having very good disease resistance, how will you get the disease resistance? It's because of a code which is there. So you cut that code, you place it over there. It becomes easier for us to do this, why? Because both these plants are having similar genetic material. So these are the processes involved in it. The new DNA that is formed is called as your recombinant DNA. And the organism that is having this uh, new artificial gene, because see, this organism when it was born, it did not have the genetic component. 
you are changing the component right now so technically it is an artificial gene that is there this is called as a transgenic organism okay so recombinant dna and transgenic organisms will involve foreign dna from an other plant animal microorganism whatever it may be <coughs> then comes into something that students have commonly seen confusing with there is something called as genome editing there is something that we just discussed which is your recombinant dna technology understand these are two different things just because you're cutting your dna doesn't mean that okay that just alone is editing because in genome editing and what is genome by the way this entire dna code which is there sometimes i don't necessarily have to add something into this code maybe in my body there is a particular code that codes for a protein that might in future cause maybe some kind of cancer for me okay so in that case i don't have to replace it i can just go edit it i can just cut it i can stop that protein from getting expressed and technically that process where inside my own body i am not adding any foreign material where some amount of deletion of genes happen or deletion of codes happen this is called as your genome editing so the difference is genome editing is manipulation of genome by within the organism itself in transgenic technology what happens is you are creating change in the genetic material but how by adding a foreign gene got it which means in to do genome editing i will not require another organism i just need my own body's own genetic content got it these are two terms that i see students getting constantly confused with before i go into the regulation part is another term i want to discuss so we talked about recombinant dna technology genome editing there's something called as gene silencing okay until now we were talking about the dna getting changed now at times as i told you you can make changes in the rna also wherein what happens is i let the dna code in all its manner but at the rna stage because right after the rna what is going to come you have your um, what you say protein coming out so either at the messenger rna stage or at the rna that is after that you know the rna stage which is there i create some change now why am i creating change see all what i want over here is i need to do the same process that i did for the dna in the case of the dna what do i do if i am taking a strand i can either cut the part that i don't want i can change the base that i don't want here also i can do these processes but i am doing it at the rna stage or the mrna stage so what happens is the dna is there the mrna comes out at the mrna stage i go and change one base so if i change the base at the mrna stage what is going to happen it will never code for the subsequent rna if it doesn't code for the rna it will not code for the protein got it so i create a change at the mrna stage or i create a change after that full rna has formed wherein that final rna is there and the rna is going to get translated into a protein at that point i go and change the base now when i'm saying i'm changing the base what happens is i can take off one component i can add extra things to it that is also a change wherein ideally if the code that is there for black hair is ucg okay what i go and do is that i can either go and replace this g okay or i know that okay along with ucg if i am putting another a also it will code for something with less harmful so i can go and insert along with ucg i will go put an a also i will insert something which means it will not code for black hair it will code for something which is something that is not very harmful for the body so i can insert i can cut it out also now this process by which this stage 
the gene expression is stopped is called as gene silencing okay so at the mrna stage or at the rna stage i add things i delete things and the gene doesn't get expressed i am basically silencing it the gene expression is silenced and it is this from this area that you have a lot of new technologies coming up called as rna inter ference micro rna anti sense rna etc and now you have to also understand this is also a clue for you to take see uh, if you take the entire this gene silencing technology it's it, the origin of it is from some 1980s period in the 1980s period the technology that was there was this anti sense rna you know what happens in this anti sense at that you have to understand uh, biotechnology is a very beautiful subject wherein as it progresses we find things that we can change at the minutest level that is the reason why we will study current affairs called as base editing and all that where one particular base that is your adenine then all gets replaced but in the earlier times what would happen is you would have in the case of the anti sense rna because our technology wasn't that good so what would happen is dna is there it will create the mrna it will create the rna and when the rna translates for the protein at that protein stage you will stop the expression of that protein this technology is called as anti sense rna okay so this is the oldest of it 1980s period after that we come on to rna interference rna interference what happens is in this rna stage we create changes got it as we have progressed further 1980s we were th doing things at the protein stage uh, after that 1990s period it was the rna interference which means when that messenger rna and all will happen but then when that final rna is out there there you create some changes thereby not coming into the protein translation okay now here in the case of micro rna you are creating changes at the mrna level got it so this is the newest thing that we are looking at for example if you look at the last 2 3 years they are using this micro rna to change the color of flowering plants okay because a certain color would be coded by a certain code which is there so you insert some extra code it will come out as a different uh, what you say a uh, fruit or different color flower or something so that is something that is extensively used in the case of these uh, horticulture crops in your orchid cultivation and all that so understand if they ask you a question it will be based on this part where is the change occurring got it clear okay now before i go on to the regulations because we are in the theory mode let's do some more theory over there next important area where upsc used to have a lot of affinity for is your stem cells okay so you i think most of your good experts in the case of stem cells so what are stem cells start off from that <clears throat> stem cells huh Function. Okay, one key word you've mentioned. Okay, they can form into any other cell. Good. Any other word associated with stem cells? Who said that? Okay, pluripotency. Okay, cool. So let's look at all these terms and try to place it. Mm. How did all our organs come into being? Like we have ears, tongue. brain lungs everything how did that happen how did that function or who decided like at what point is where all of this got formed into different organisms 
Okay, now I'm not looking at the bigger picture of it, not the evolution picture. That is in your environment class, in the biotechnology class. Let's look a little bit smaller. Okay, think of this. Every organism, when it is in its embryonic stage. Okay, let's start from there. Stem cells, let's start from there and then we'll go into the details of it. At its embryonic stage, embryonic means when our body or in um, was in initially, you know, it's a single cell zygote which is there. It divides into 2, 4, 8, 16 cell. Until the 16 cell, it keeps on dividing. After that, the next stage of division which is 32 and 64, what happens is our cells that are formed over there have this very unique feature which he mentioned as pluripotency meaning you those cells which are formed over there they can be anything okay it's like giving a motivational speech it can be anything it can be lungs it can be brain it can be heart it can be anything you want and these stem cells what they do is this stem cells is what gets differentiated into each and every organ that we have in our body so the undifferentiated cells, initially when they formed, they didn't know what they could be. Okay, Those undifferentiated cells which had the feature of pluripotency and which could be any other organ that they wanted is your stem cells. So your common features being they are unspecialized as in when they are formed, they don't have any specific function. But once they become heart, they will have, uh, sorry, when once they become heart uh, cells, they will have a specific function related to that. Lung cells, specific function related to that. This is your, in your embryonic stage. And obviously, whatever we have in our embryonic stage will not get disappeared once we get, once we are born, right? So, from the embryonic stage, later on what happens is from, from the point the kid gets or the uh, child is given birth, at this point, these stem cells, by now it is formed into different, different organs. The child has a heart, a brain, skin, everything. But still some of it remain. Some of those stem cells remain. And those stem cells so happen to come out in the one place is the umbilical cord that the kid is connected to the mother in. So in those umbilical cord, you have some stem cells. Then inside the baby itself, in its bone marrow region, in certain areas and all, you will have the stem cells. But point being, the one that was initially there, they were like super, they were like I could be anything. But at this point, they are like okay fine, there are, I, I, I am still stem cell, but then I do not have pluripotency to that extreme levels. Okay, so understand it is at the embryonic stage that the stem cells are its most effective. After that, when it comes into an adult, for example, right now in my bone marrow, there will be stem cells. But to extract it, to create it into something else will be a much more tedious process and they are much lesser in number also. Got it. So, as we go and move apart, the stem cells, the pluripotency of the stem cells reduces. The uh, effectiveness of capturing it and changing its form also reduces. Keep this in your mind. So, stem cells are unspecialized cells. This process of unspecialized stem cells giving rise to specialized cells, as in like the normal one changing into different, different other parts is called as differentiation. This is a technical term, it's called as differentiation. Now, there are, as I told you, there are two kinds of stem cells, embryonic stem cells, non-embryonic stem cells. Uh, the non-embryonic ones are normally found in your bone marrow, peripheral blood tissues, etc. Okay. <sighs> Need to discuss few pointers regarding this, not the general pointers. Um, you So now you do understand, if you have stem cells and if you somehow uh, kept it somewhere safe, okay, so we were all at an embryonic stage, we were there, not at the embryonic stage. Now, embryonic stage, you will have to get formed into a fetus and finally, maybe in the umbilical cord, whatever stem cell is there, I can maybe preserve it. Okay. Now, the ethical question of it is only when at the embryonic stage, you capture those stem cells because that indirectly means you are killing off the fetus which is there because that embryonic cells which are there if I am capturing I am taking it out of the mother I 
and I am differentiating and creating some organ in the lab. Technically, what has happened is that fetus has got aborted. So that is an ethical question. Okay, we are not talking about that. We are talking about after the child has been born, inside the umbilical cord, whatever stem cell is there, I can maybe preserve it. I have few questions for you. These stem cells which are there, extracted from a person, can that be used only by him or can it be even given to his family members? You can only give it to, as she had mentioned, to siblings born in that same, like for example, she said twins, they can use it. To an extent, maybe the mother can use it. Even for that, I am talking about the difference in degrees. Siblings which are twins, mother, thereafter father and any of the other family members. So there is a clear degree in difference. And not just because you come from one family, you cannot easily take your stem cell and give it to another person. Because even at the stem cell level, just like we have our blood groups, there is a lot of compatibility issue that has to be taken care of. So few of the things that I need to get in thing. One is not all your family members can use your stem cells and uh, be benefited by it. Second thing is, it is preserved in liquid nitrogen. When you have to preserve any stem cell, it's preserved in liquid nitrogen. Technically, there is no expiry date for the stem cell. It will not be like, okay, after 2050, it is cannot be used. Nothing like that. As long as these conditions are maintained, the temperature and the cryogenic conditions are maintained, it technically does not have an expiry date. But the evidence suggests that until now, when you in a time of 20 years, it is always better to use it to have the proper efficacy. Got it? So I wanted to keep both these facts based on what the statement comes, take a call on it. Technically, there is no expiry date. But scientific evidence suggests that up to 20 years, it will be efficient. Not that it will, after the 20, 21st year, it will be like, a, no, it will be there, but the efficacy will be reduced is scientific evidence. Got it. Then using this, almost 70 blood related disorders can now be, at least on paper, it, these many diseases can be cured using your uh, what you say, stem cells. Okay, few of the examples being sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, leukemia, immune related or immunity related diseases. Okay, so this is about your stem cells, few of the regulations associated with them. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, yeah. See, I am not saying that is the only cure for thalassemia. You have other cases also. Thalassemia, but you have certain cases where it is caused by certain, uh, you know, related to the neuro, uh, neuro cells which are there. So, if any damage of such kind has happened, you can use these stem cells to regenerate those cells. Got it? So, you have different cures. See, now it doesn't mean that for sickle cell anemia or thalassemia or any of these things, it will only be these cures. Even these can be used for the cure. Just like for example, when we talk about cancer, you have chemotherapy, you have immunotherapy, you have CAR, CAR T cell therapy, you have so many different techniques. Even in the case of these diseases, that is the case. A uh, few of the regulations I want to discuss because right now, ICMR does not recommend commercial stem cell banking. And I specifically I am mentioning this, that is primarily because your Indian Council of Medical Research says there is no scientific basis for preservation of cord blood for future self-use. This might seem like a very counterintuitive statement in the examination hall because we just learned about how umbilical cord can be used. But ICMR and this is specifically the Indian regulations say that there is no actual scientific base. So we do not generally prefer commercial stem cell banking. So all of these things where you see hospitals trying to uh, tell parents that you please preserve your umbilical cord, this is not something that ICMR approves of. Okay. 
according to icmr the only case where such kind of cord blood banking is preferred is when an elder child in the family has a condition treatable with stem cells and the mother is expecting the next baby which means technically if there is a sibling related at that point icmr is like fine okay you can go about with your stem cells but in all the other cases the commercial stem cell banking thing is not preferred in india clear okay. these things and all because science and tech you have to be very specific with the wordings it's not uh, unlike your other subjects where there's a word and you can generally take the meaning that's not the case that's why i'm going on specifying technically scientific evidence in this case this is the one now coming on to few current affairs that have come about with relation to your stem cells the first one being xenobots what is xenobots guys have you heard about it tell me okay fine okay cool cool some else we have got some things uh <coughs> Zeno bots, bots again. You have some robotic element over here, but thing is, you're creating certain robots from the stem cells of frogs. Okay, so ideally, right now at this point, it is a frog stem cells that is used. You can use any other organism stem cells, and you can create these. See, you understand it? When we look at a human fetus, it has specific features and organs and everything. But beyond or prior to that. you have stages where you can take the stem cells and just create the brain or the nervous system alone right and in this nervous system and brain you can do experiments and see like okay i am giving a certain impulse how does the brain react so in all these manners you can study individual organ systems also using stem cells so xenobots are robots made from stem cells of frogs they can self heal after damage record memories and work together in groups which means this is what one xenobot looks like you create this group you have several other xenobots also they can work in coordination why because again how is all this happening it's not some computer code you are creating stem cells that will get con so for one part will be the brain like thing next part will be similar to some kind of a neuron or a nervous system which is there third one will be some motor sensory thing so all of it will can coordinate and work together they can also record information about their surroundings how can they record information are we recording information right now yes same way xenobots also can record because you have the cells which are similar of neuron structures clear so this is one current affair next one is your lab grown meat okay so again this is a very uh, upcoming if you look at this lot of ads which call pseudo foods and everything what is the idea you are cultivating meat but then you're not killing of organisms but instead what you're doing is you are taking the stem cells and creating it similar so stem cells can be differentiated into anything right so you create something similar to the muscle cells of certain organisms take the stem cells from chicken or pig or um, cow or whatever it is and from there you do changes to create it in the form of a muscle cell and when several muscle cells are cultured in this manner you get somewhat similar to a huge chunk of meat this is getting very popular these days i'm i'm not sure how the taste and all is but uh, <laughs> it's getting popular and again it comes because see it's important because the core of it is your stem cell you're using living cells your stem cells and you're creating this lab grown meat it's otherwise called as clean meat or cultured meat cultured meat just because it's cult done in the lab okay nothing else <laughs> it's done in the lab using this different kinds of cultures that is why it's called cultured meat okay yeah yeah there are so many practical applications i'll tell you how uh, now we'll study one more term at this point it will be clear see now 
one org one uh, organ that is constantly baffled our scientists is your brain because it's quite difficult to understand how brain stores things how brain processes certain, certain stimuli and reacts to it we can commonly say okay brain gets the message then nervous system acts <laughs> but it's not it's not robotic like that right for example even the idea of how things get stored how do you recollect things these are all things that the scientists are quite baffled by so now it's practically not possible to cut off human brain in the living condition and study all of these things so you can recreate or what you can say emulate a human brain through these things which are there and thus you can study so anything that we are quite unaware of and it becomes a practical consideration that we cannot use human bodies living human bodies at that point you can create these xenobots which are living and can emulate human cells clear yeah. let's go into the next topic again for some reason because of all these hollywood movies we have very wrong ideas regarding this particular technical term which is let's start off with cloning first okay and the idea of cloning is okay just let's just break it down first in the first place there are two types of cloning not the ones that i've written over there there's natural cloning and there's artificial cloning okay start off with that natural and artificial i want you to understand this first one liner definition about cloning cloning is not creating exact photocopies of something that is not the idea of cloning you create photocopies but of what of genetic material this is the idea so this you have to get very clear so don't when you hear clone don't instantly think okay fine one archana second archana no that is not the idea you have cloning on a genetic level and sometimes because the genetic material is same you will have the same features but sometimes not all the genetic material will get expressed so you will have different features so get this clear in your mind cloning of any type need not necessarily guarantee identical copies okay so cloning does not mean not identical copies identical identical when i'm saying it's the you know the, the face to face like your is like this hair is like this if it's a plant okay so the shape is like this nothing like that you need not always have identical copies but sometimes you might have so if a statement comes which says cloning is the creation of physically similar identical looking things no it's not cloning technically means somehow you are having genetic material same in both the copies okay now it differs natural and artificial based on how this genetic material comes into each organism sometimes natural cloning would just mean something as similar as can you give me some examples of natural cloning huh Oh, we went to the more uh, technically confusing. It's small. Some in plants and all. Do you see cloning? Do you see cloning in plants? Have you heard the idea of taking something called as vegetative propagation, where you take one bud of the plant and, or not bud, you take one entire leaf of the plant and you create a similar organism? They will have the same genetic material. So here. different kinds of i let me just list it out all for you what happened guys any doubt okay you have so many different things you see natural cloning in microorganisms you see natural cloning in plants and then you see natural cloning in animals in the case of microorganism if you take any kind of we would have studied in our smaller classes no fission process wherein what happens is you have an organism the same cell is there the same cell splits into two that process you fragmentation for example in hydra plant what happens the hydra grows at one point there will be like a bud sort of a thing it will be there it will get broken off that gets into another thing 
all these are methods of natural cloning the reason being the same genetic material is being carried forward so in microorganisms you have these techniques in plants you have your vegetative propagation in animals as she mentioned twins are there but not all twins are your clones which means not all when i'm saying not all twins are your clones it means that not all twins will have carry that same copies of the genetic material so you can say twins but the twins are should be mono what one minute i heard something else i got it i heard something else was there you all said zygotic mono zygotic so i am assuming by your enthusiasm you all know how twins are formed so you don't i am not going to explain more uh, this uh, concept monozygotic means after the fusion has happened uh, you have your egg cell and the sperm after the fusion has happened from there it splits those are your monozygotic twins the other one is your dizygotic ones wherein you two separate uh, ova two different sperms come fuse they create two different zygotes even the uh, twins asters will have two separate placentas they will have two separate placentas in a dizygotic one those are not clones got it so these are all one kind of cloning the other kind of cloning again reproductive and therapeutic and for this we need to know this concept how many of you are aware about this so that i can quickly somatic cell nuclear transfer you know hmm. guys why are you not speaking up am i asking you i'm just asking if you know or don't know if you don't know i'll probably teach if you say you know i'll skip it so just tell me you know okay cool so we'll just quickly what See, this is why you have to raise your voice. In India, you always have to raise your voice for things. Otherwise, nobody will hear. Okay, here. In this case, somatic cell nuclear transfer. I want you to get clarified on one thing. In our body, there are let me there are a lot of different types of cells. But if I had to broadly place, what are the two different types of cells? You have a reproductive cell and you have a somatic cell. somatic cell is what is there in your entire body your what you say skin your heart your hair brain everywhere the kind of cells which are there in your body are called generally by the term somatic cells reproductive cells are specifically in your reproductive gametes which are there so you have ovum or your sperm which will have those reproductive cells okay now the point over here is as i told you there are two types of cloning which upsc finds affinity towards reproductive and therapeutic the crux of both reproductive and therapeutic comes from this concept of somatic cell nuclear transfer so if they ask you a question and they have already asked this scnt will lead to reproductive cloning and therapeutic cloning what is the difference between reproductive and therapeutic we will see as we go further first thing you have to know is so in the case of the somatic cell nuclear transfer what happens is you take a body cell which is there which is from our body itself you can take that cell and in that cell you will have this is a somatic body cell you have this normal egg cell which is there that is a reproductive cell what happens over here is the nucleus from the somatic cell is taken out so somatic cell nuclear transfer you understand if you ever get confused just remember the name from the somatic cell you are extracting the nucleus and in from this egg cell you are removing the nucleus away which means any hereditary material that the egg cell has carried is now not there anymore got it why because the nucleus had all the hereditary material you're removing the nucleus away you're just giving the casing of this got it and at this process what you do is you take the casing of the egg cell and you take the nucleus of the somatic cell fuse it to gather why are you doing this <laughs> why can it just not be as normal as it is the reason being first thing is 
you do these things when you want to create genetically similar organisms you want to create a lot of clones with each other now to create clones look at the feature of our somatic cell the feature of our somatic cell if you look at it the nucleus in it has majority of the genetic component and on top of it each somatic cell of our body has a complete set of our chromosomes got it full 23 pairs are there the human chromosomes are 23 pairs 46 in number your somatic cell has full 23 pairs but your egg cell has just one half of it where is the other half going to come from from the other reproductive cell this is why the zygote at the end will have 23 pairs but here individually it will just have one set of 23 so you are using this primarily for two reasons one you want to have this nature of the egg cell which is very reproductive in nature see look at the casing you are taking the egg cells casing the egg cells casing comes or the egg cell has this nature whereby it can propagate in a quick manner you need that quick propagation but you don't need the genetic material of the egg cell so what you do is take the genetic material of this one take the casing of this one and you create this process and you create a group of cells so once one cell is getting created you can create multiple multiple numbers like this in that you will culture in your lab until this process it's same for both reproductive and therapeutic cloning the difference comes from what you do with this particular thing sometimes this particular group of cells is put into another organism and that other organism will give birth to another creature in that case it will become a reproductive cloning got it which means you are using these cells transfusing it into another organism and that other organism gives birth to it i think i have a picture for that yeah that is one way of doing it one more picture the other method of or that is your reproductive cloning in your therapeutic cloning what you do is these cells which have got created for example there is some part of our body which is getting damaged maybe uh, some for some person there is some lungs or something that is getting damaged so what you do is you culture this to be your lung cells and you some lung cells have already got damaged you use these cells to replace those damaged cells so understand any of these things will happen because why why can you replace it for your lung cells because what is the nature of it it's a somatic cell somatic cells are our body cells only got it only what has changed over here the nuclear casing is that of the somatic cell only the casing of this has changed but ideally the genetic material can be used to express your lung cells or heart not heart lung whatever other part which is there is this clear to you okay now one other method also that happens is in you would have probably heard so when the dolly the sheep which we all famously know that is an example of reproductive cloning got it in the case of dolly the she um, sheep what has happened is again same process happens in this case i told you both is taken from it can be taken from my own body but in the case of dolly the sheep what happened is somatic cell is from one organism egg cell is from an other organism that is the only difference which means what reproductive cloning can happen in that manner also got it you can take it from two separate organisms or from a single organism i hope the base of all this is clear now very quickly you all know this concept three parent baby what is the idea of three parent baby why is a three parent please quickly tell me why three parents okay you define parent based on from what all genetic material is coming okay so you just tell me you some of you told me surrogate mother okay uh, technically let's not venture into it but then tell me why or what are these three different sets of genetic material that have come why three different sets of genetic material can you tell me why we need three parent baby 
Ah, yeah, that is the process. But why do we need this? That all that story. Oh, it's fine. We'll get into the story. But why? <laughs> Why? No, if all this is the reason I will not keep asking. One, there's only one point. Why do we even have this new invention out there where we realize we don't, we are done with two parent, we need three parent at this point. That is the point. Mitochondrial genetic material is defective. Got it. This is the crutch, not uh, cell casing, cell. All that is the process. Which you all do know. I realized you all know about the process. But the crux of it is because, as I told you, a lot of our genetic material is in your primary nucleus. But there is a small part of genetic material which is there in the mitochondria. Got it. Now, if that mitochondria of the mother or of the biological mother is defective, that genetic defect will get carried over to the baby also. Why? Because... Take the egg cell, which is there. The egg cell is there. You have the mitochondria, which is different. This is the biological mother. At this point, there are only two parents. Okay, the, fa the biological father, the biological mother. The biological mother has a nucleus with very healthy genetic material. Okay, and in the mitochondria of the egg cell, they are finding some defect. Ideally, what happens is if the father's uh, what do you say male gamete comes and fuses. The father has nothing to contribute over here. The male gamete comes, it fuses with the egg cell. This egg cell is what gets transformed into a zygote, which means this mitochondrial defect will get carried forward to the next generation. So all you need is a healthy mitochondria with a healthy gen, I mean genetic material. And that is where the third parent comes. So almost a large majority of the genetic material is from the biological parents. Got it. Half from the mother, half from the father, whatever it is. But then a mere 1% or even lesser than that comes from the, the next, the surrogate mother. You can call her the surrogate mother or the third parent, whatever. This is the concept. So, I do, do I have to explain the details of it? It's clear, no? So, the idea is you have the biological mother's things the mitochondria which is defective gets removed off uh, the parents or the third parents mitochondria alone is just utilized or you can also do that there are two ways this process is done either you can transfer the entire nucleus of the biological mother into the surrogate mother or you can create a surrogate mother where all these features, only the kind of uh, what you say, uh, all this thing will be cultured in the outside. Then you create a surrogate mother and put the genetic component in her. Whatever it is, it leads to three parents because a part of the genetic material comes from a third person who is not the biological or you cannot technically call it even because, because they are giving the genetic material, they are also considered as biological parents in some laws. Okay, so this is three parent baby. Now I had left one slide in the beginning, right? Where is that? Yeah, I uh, just found this interesting. I think I took it from some PT, I guess. Uh, just the fact that in India, and now we've discussed a large majority of the things that are happening. We've talked about genetic modification, genetic different, different techniques and everything. What are the regulations that ha have an impact on the genetic scene in India. So it can be genetic modification, it can be your three parent baby, it can be any of these things, stem cell research, any of these things. The common ones, I, I do feel you will detect few of this, which is Biological Diversity Act. Already when I was explaining in class, I had mentioned to you Biological Diversity Act in the environment class. I had mentioned as to how there are different, different groups of bodies underneath it, which deal with your genetic content. So you Biological Diversity Act. Uh, next is your Drugs and Cosmetic Act. Seed Act. All those you will guess. I think the ones that you might not guess are these both. You have Disaster Management Act. And you have FSSAI. Food Safety and Standards Act of 2006. 
all of these have an impact on the genome editing and genetic material. Got it? Any any guesses as to why disaster management would have been in the mix? Yeah, bio weapons, biological disasters, all of that could be categorized under that. That is why your DMAC. So maybe if you are the kind who overthinks the answer, you might reach to the disaster management. But if you are a normal UPSC aspirant, you will be like, hey, disaster management. <laughs> okay. So all these acts have an impact on the genome editing scene, which is there in India. Now let's move on to GM mustard again I thought twice before I had to put this in but then again I figured some of you who just have to get it revised quickly let's just deal with this slide I will not be going into what gene is taken what happens first of all let me ask you one word answer why did we make GM mustard just okay she says insect resistance. Do you all agree with that? Is that the only reason? Any? She's saying one more answer. Anyone else? Can I ask you if insect resistance is there, what else can be achieved from it? She said the answer. High yield. So, if GM mustard comes, and this is a trend that UPSC has, wherein they'll take BT cotton, BT brinjal, they'll ask two questions which are very fact, two statements factual. Third one is like, this was for herbicide tolerance, or this was created for what? This GM mustard was a herbicide tolerant mustard that got created even for your high yield. So not insect resistance, herbicide tolerance and your high yield. Got it? So this is indigenously developed, genetically modified variant of a herbicide tolerance thing. DMH11 is a cross between two basic species, the Indian mustard, which was named Varuna and the East European early Hira 2 mustard species, which is there. So it's a cross between both and you have two, in fact, three major, major gene components, which is Barnes, Barster and Bar gene, which is isolated from soil bacterium called as Bacillus amylocufaceans. Okay. All these are the factors that you have to look out for. Who created your uh, GM mustard? Which organization created it? ICMR. Wow. Find. This is a past UPC question. In fact, if you even solve that question, you would get this answer. Okay. <clears throat> it's eleven thirty. I said I would give a break. Do you want it right now? Huh? No. So I'll take further class. Few more minutes and then I'll give a break. You have to understand if anyone has to be exhausted. I am the first one who is going to be exhausted over here. <laughs> uh, coming to this next concept, genome sequencing. Again, a lot of current affair related terms are going to come in this category of genome sequencing. But the concept is so simple. The idea is basically, what do you think is genome sequencing? What is your idea right now? Re rearrangement. Arrangement. Okay. Arrangement of genetic material. Okay. Anything else? Anyone else? Genome sequencing. Red t-shirt. Tell me. Tell you have some answer, right? You were saying no, thinking. Okay, fine. Again, be very careful with these terms. Just genome sequencing primarily means understanding the exact order of base pairs in an individual. Which means 
you know, that A, T, G, C, the entire code which is there, understanding that order. Now, the point is, and this is the important thing, you be, need not say, now if I, this is again like saying, if I want to know all the books in the library, I can either go and read all the books, the titles of it, or I can just ask the librarian for some code which is there. Right. So, there are two things. To understand the sequence, I can either go and look at all the genome content and find out which are all the base pairs or I can take one part and then understand that specific part, culture the rest of it and then also understand. Based on how much part you are taking and understanding the base pairs, you have something called as whole genome sequencing which is the one that is one minute. <laughs> which is the one that is right now doing all its rounds because in the whole genome sequencing you try to take you try take an entire genetic material you sit and code for the now you don't code you try to figure out okay this is the code this is the code and use it so this is equivalent to you going in the library and reading out all the books okay now the good point of doing it is what again coming back to the example see now when you go and read all the books in the library, the advantage is, is tomorrow if someone asks you, hey, where is that book? You That book is there in that library. You will know for sure. Okay, yeah, that is there on this column and this place, it is there. But if you are just taking one part from the librarian and just trying to understand, you will know how many codes are there. But you will not know exactly where to start looking for it. Got it? So, this is the difference between whole genome sequencing and part by part genome sequencing. So, genome sequencing as it is, is sequencing the entire genome, uh, sequencing a genome or deciphering the exact order of base pairs in an individual. You can use your saliva, epithelial cells, bone marrow, hair, seeds, whatever you need to do this kind of a coding because we have genetic material in all of this. Now, again, one catch over here is if they ever give just hair or you have to just see if they have specified something because hair as it is. So, if I am just plucking one part of my hair at this point, I will not be able to code entirely. I need a hair follicle. That means I will need a living cell as part of it because in your dead cells, you will not find the genetic material entirely. You need a living cell and that is your criteria. If they give three, four different options, just figure out which is the living cell in there. And from the living cell, you will be able to sequence the genome. Got it? And the whole genome sequence or the whole genome cannot be sequenced all at once. So what happens is in the case of, um, and when I'm saying all at once, it doesn't mean that, okay, it will never happen. But if I have to get the entire genome sequencing, what I have to do is, I will have to take separately the chromosomal DNA or the one that is there in the nucleus and the one in the mitochondria and in the case of the plants, I have to take the one in the chloroplast. Once all of this is done is where I can say whole genome sequencing has happened. So again, that is a catch. If I am just sequencing the DNA which is there in my nucleus, that is not whole genome sequencing. If whole genome sequencing has to happen, mitochondrial and chloroplast related genome also has to be sequenced. I just hope you are noting these points down. I am going on saying this is the specific part. This is this. Yeah. Which part? Uh, from where? From the library? Okay. So, uh, in the case of... See. Genome is there in our body. Okay. We have to understand the order of the base pairs. Okay. I can do it in several parts. I can either just take one small part, sit and study that individual part, and maybe culture that entire genome in my lab. Okay. That is also possible. Or I can take an entire genome and sit and look through the entire base codes. Now, in the case of the first part which I said, you are not whole genome sequencing. 
that I'm just taking one genetic part which is there and coding for the rest inside a lab condition based on this particular code. So for example, if I'm getting a sequence which is ATGCCC, then I'll be like, okay, fine. Based on this, this, based on my previous research and everything, okay, this would be the next set of code. You're just putting things from place to place. It's like me coming and asking you, take the library example. If in the case of the part by part, I can either go and ask the librarian. So the librarian would be like, okay, fine. We have 10 history books, 50 history books, uh, 50 geography books. And I come to five of you who are very frequently visiting the library. And I'll be like, okay, history is where? So you'll see history is on that shelf. But you don't know about geography. The other one will tell me where the physics books are. Based on all the information I've got from five of them, I'll plug it together and be like, okay fine so maybe history is here geography is here so on so which means when i do part by part genome sequencing there is always a scope for repetition or a scope for some error over there got it because you in any any case what happens is when you code for this you're coding based on several several informations you have so it can get repeatedly there but in the whole genome sequencing where someone is going and individually looking at each code which is there and putting out. So I'm taking one person's genome and I'm sitting and I'm reading that. Okay, TGCC. Okay, next code, next code, next code. And I'm sitting and learning this entire thing. Then what happens is there are higher chances of efficiency over there. Now, the, this is the first part that I mentioned. So that is called as whole genome sequencing. I added another point saying, if I have to say whole genome sequencing has happened, then where all do I have genome? I have genome in the nucleus and I have genome in the mitochondria. If I'm a plant, I have genome in the nucleus and I have genome in the chloroplast. So I can ideally say my whole genome has been sequenced only when all the genetic material of all this has been coded exactly. Clear? Okay. Who did this? As in, we Ah, we come to all of them, not say, ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to study all of them in detail. No, just a minute. Let's get to the base parts because all our current affairs is going to answer the question. It's not who did this, who all are doing this. Everybody is obsessed with this right now because uh, think of it, uh, every, don't even take Indian, every single place, the genetic, we all are so different, right? Each person is so unique, which means there is some change in all of our genetic material. It, especially since we are the most populous nation at this point, it's going to be practically impossible to sit and genetically get the sequence of all of us. So we take a subset and we find out, okay, so this is the common things. So for example, if in Indians, maybe there's a higher degree of diabetes in comparison to someone else, that would have something to do with our genetic coding also. Got it. So now using such codes, you will understand this. I'll come to it. Uh, we are moving into that area. But before I go, now I told you in the whole genome sequencing, I'm sitting and writing out all the codes. If it's useless or useful, I am not looking. I'm like A, T, G, C, 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 C. This is like how we copy assignments in our engineering class. Not bother. We'll not even use our mind. We'll just be like, okay, fine. This line is there. This line is there. Just keep doing it. But some scientists are like, if I copy all those useless things, we just have to copy the ones which are useful, right? Just the ones which will code for something good. The one that will code for some genetic protein, which is there. Like for example, if there's a code, uh, CGUT, something like that. This is going to code for something. Beyond that, it's useless. Beyond Before that also, it's useless. So some scientists, they were very smart. They were like, I will just make a sequence of the ones which are useful. And thus comes the co point called as exome maps. Exome primarily means the portion of the genes responsible for making proteins. And it occupies just one percentage of the actual genetic material. Got it? So if you take the entire DNA structure, there will be few parts over there which codes for something in our body. Only that part is called as exome. And if you're mapping only that particular map, it's called as exome maps. Got it? 
So exome maps are not whole genome sequencing. Okay, exome maps are just sequencing of the usual functional part of your genetic material. Who's from a non-science background here? Okay, are you guys understanding? Understanding or not? You also from non-science? Okay, fine. Coming to Archana's question of who all are doing it. First, let's start from uh, globally. You had something called as a human genome project, which we started off way earlier in 1998 period. A lot of countries took part in it. Right now, that is the old, old story. So, we're not discussing about that. Right now, we first have Genome India project. Genome India project started in 2020 organized by the Department of Biotechnology. Their idea is to collect 10,000 genetic samples from citizens across India to build the reference genome. Okay, so they will not be looking. So, for example, if I have a very specific, for example, if there is some person with uh, blue eyes, okay, that is not a common feature of all the Indians. So, in the reference genome, they will not see which is going to code for those blue eyes. They will be checking for, okay, the height, the general features that are seen as part of an Indian, uh, what you say, uh, genetic structure. They will take 10,000 samples from all around the country and they will do the genome sequencing of it. Okay, so you must be thinking 10,000 is such a small number, but imagine if we set out to do the entire number, where would it stop? So, the idea is just to create a reference genome. So, common diseases, for example, heart diseases, mental, uh, nowadays they have been even saying that a lot of mental health issues are related to your hidden parts in your genome. We will be discussing about that. Even that, all of this can be taken as a reference genome, but 10,000 Indians. Next project is Indigen. Again, I would urge you to create a small table and write all this because we are having now the first one we discussed Genome India. We have an Indigen, then we have a consortium coming up. A lot of these terms are coming up. So, I would suggest just create a small table who's, which is the project, the genome sequencing project. Who is doing this? What is the sample size? These are your differentiators. Indigen again is done by CSIR, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. And their idea, they are planning to do whole genome sequencing for 1008 Indians from different ethnicities. Got it. So, this is your second one. These are all just immediate factual thing. If they ever ask you a question, it will be, they will start off with indigen. They will ask you one term about it. Then they will go into the concept of genome sequencing next. Got it. So, this is why that concept was explained in detail. Next, coming into a very crucial body that has taken form uh, very recently, I would say. It's called as India's Genome Consortium. Okay. India's Genome Consortium came at the wake of December 2020 and we all know what happened at December 2020. What happened guys? Yeah, COVID. COVID-19 started happening and then we had this one creature which was undergoing genetic mutations by the minute. So then you needed not one or two but then you had 10 labs. It's a network of 10 labs that come together continuously monitoring the genome changes in the COVID one. And again, they were doing this through whole genome sequencing. Again and again, I'm stressing on the point. If they do ask you a question, it will be based on this particular technique. They will go into the details of what this whole genome sequencing is. They will not ask you a very superficial question. Okay, clear? So, India's Genome Consortium, 10 labs, it's a network of 10 labs all around India. They are studying specifically, not anything else, only your COVID virus, the mutations, the genetic things in this COVID virus. Hmm. Hmm. I'll, uh, oh, I haven't sent the slides to you. Like, I'll give you the slides. 
don't write all this details if you're putting in a table quickly fine but don't sit and write paragraphs and paragraphs okay next one again one organization now this is uh, in any of your major genome sequencing things right now we discussed csir we talked about dbt anything related to dbt is primarily for example the first one that we did india genome project it will be technically put into practice by this organization it's called as biotechnology industry research assistance council otherwise called as birac again it's a not for profit enterprise set up by department of biotechnology their idea is it is also a public sector enterprise understand just like a normal psc it is there their primary idea is see we need to do whole genome sequencing but that that is done by whom the academia which is there the research people but in most of the times the uh, funding for it the uh, what you say technical expertise for it and all is a huge cost so birac primarily what it does is they will provide a connecting link between the researchers and the industry in that area so for example if they are creating a new vaccine the researchers in the lab maybe they'll get connected with bharat biotech or some other organization which is there which will come together so your key for birac is it provides an industry academia linkage okay so that is birac done done written written Don't, again oh i should have just given you the slides when i think you guys will not have ended up writing all of this don't have to write all of this huh not hearing who say i'm not in, yeah what happened here table you are making okay cool next is dark genome this is the one that i mentioned very recently uh, what is being said is that see <clears throat> now there is they are still trying to find out the cause of this but understand just like we have dark matter and everything in space we have something called as dark genome because they they term this dark genome because right now using your genome sequencing you can find out almost if you sit and spend time and money and everything on it you can sit and sequence almost every other code which is there in your genome okay so all of this got coded but still sometimes we scientists started finding out that there are some diseases that are there in humans which don't have any other explanations got it so for example they are not caused by environmental factors they are not caused by any of these other conditions but they also have proof that this is getting transmitted from one generation to another so understand this it's quite dark for them they are like it's getting transmitted from one generation to another but when we coded for it they could not find any protein or anything that related to that disease so now scientists are like somewhere this code is hidden or some way it is not visible to the scientists and they have termed that as dark genome so dark genome are your gene regions that cannot be adequately sequenced or aligned using your standard short read sequencing technologies short read sequencing technologies are the ones that i earlier told you where you take small small parts and you try to sequence it so they are not able to understand this and commonly the diseases that they have found related to such dark genome is schizophrenia and bipolar disorder both of those are mental illnesses as in like for example if there is a parent who has a higher schizophrenic tendencies sometimes it is seen to be reflected in the coming child also but then they are not able to figure out see is it would have been so much better if they were able to figure out the gene and change the genetic code so that the generation would not have to suffer but then here they are not able to find where this is happening got it so that is your dark genome next we move on to okay now you guys go take a break because crispr cas9 and all that is take time so it's 11 um 
What time is this? Huh. 11.55. 12, 10, 12. We'll start. Online guys, I hope all of you are back. My voice clear. Okay, cool. Let's start with the next set of topics. <clears throat> We would just brush through because CRISPR Cas9, I believe, uh, even if you don't know DNA or RNA, CRISPR Cas9, you all know, like at the back of your hand, everyone knows the concept behind it. Quickly, we'll, I mean, anyone who doesn't know? Huh? Anyone who doesn't know CRISPR Cas9? Like, what do I have to make out of your faces? I'm not a mind reader. You're looking at me so blank. Do you know? You know. Okay, fine. See, uh, broadly, if you look at it, as I told you right now, if we ever want to make changes into the structures which are there, so we told your DNA, you can make changes. In your RNA, you can make changes. In all of these things, we can either delete something or we can also add something. We can make any change we want. CRISPR-Cas9 is one method to do this kind of an editing process. Okay. Now, it just comes into the idea that CRISPR-Cas9 is one of the most popular methods. We have other methods also. In CRISPR-Cas9, the primary idea is this, where you have three major things. You have something called as a guide RNA molecule. Then you also have a DNA cutting enzyme, which is called as your Cas9 enzyme. Okay. What, what you try to do in over here is, see, Cas9, um, now for example, you have a certain, uh, what you say, genetic material which is there and in the genetic material there is a code which is coding for something maybe cancer or some kind of specific um, hormone production or something and you don't want that specific code over there so what do you do is you normally when you have to change something we are very easily say, saying that okay fine you go cut dna put something over there fix it with this this is not happening with glue or anything it is happening because of certain enzymes so what happens over there is first you identify which is a defective part once you identify what the defective part is you go and you you know very broadly where the defective part is but then to cut it at the exact same points you create something called as a guide RNA. Okay, what the guide RNA will do is, it will go and it will have an exact match complementary to the particles which are over there. So now you know, okay, this guide RNA will go and attach itself only to those specific coded parts. So the guide RNA comes, once the guide RNA comes and finds that exact defective area, then you the, your Cas9 enzyme will get activated. Cas9 is the cutting enzyme which is there. So the Cas9 cuts this part and then later on you can maybe put a healthy DNA strand in, in its place. This is the idea of your CRISPR Cas9. So guide RNA molecular scissor like enzyme. Now using this CRISPR Cas9 is where this here one current affair that is there is this one. <coughs> To control the mosquito populations in certain areas, they have devised a technique called as sterile insect technique. Now, the crux of the sterile insect technique is obviously the mosquito propagates based on certain ideas that is there in its genetic code. So, what you do is you take the genetic code which codes for the propagation of mosquito and you replace it with something that induces sterility. Which means, sterility means what? It will not be able to reproduce any further. In this way, they are planning to control your mosquito populations. This specific technique called as guided sterile insect technique to restrict mosquito populations uses your CRISPR-Cas9. So, this is one current affair which has come about. So, again, if they do ask it, understand, if they just ask you sterile insect technique, all the machinery or all the techniques that we use in your CRISPR-Cas9 is the same thing that is used in the sterile insect 
technique which is there. And other current affair is this one. Fn cas line. F in Cas9, again, you are trying to treat sickle cell anemia over there. Someone had asked me before the break. Who was that? That person itself is not there. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. So, there was the idea of where, for example, there is a disease called as your sickle cell anemia. Uh, just quickly on to the idea of what sickle cell, what exactly is sickle cell anemia? What is this? Yeah. Again, the point being, see, our blood cells are in that very beautiful bowl like shape because there is a genetic code that says your red blood cell should be in that particular shape. Which means if there is some defect in that particular code, the red blood cells will not hold its shape. So instead of that concave shape, what would happen is you will have some kind of a sickle like shape. And because this is again, the point over here is, see, if the RBC is in this particular shape, it is, it is quite equipped to carry the hemoglobin all around the body. But if it is having a sickle shell, it is not equipped to carry adequate hemoglobin throughout the body. That is the first problem. The second problem is because of this very weird shape, these cells get blocked into your arteries also. Because if it's round shape, it will flow. If it's a sickle shape, it will go and get stacked on top and all. So what happens is it will clog the things. In effect, what happens is the entire blood flow of the person gets affected. This is the idea. So here now what they have figured out is, so you know, the solution is quite simple. You just have to find the genetic, if it's actually caused by a genetic code. So here, find out the genetic code, replace it with a healthier one. And they did that using this Fn Cas9. What they did is, they derived a healthy, healthy DNA from a bacterium which is called as Francisella novicida. So you got the healthy DNA from that. The defective GA is over there. Using your functional Cas9 or not functional, Fn Cas9 enzyme, you go and cut this part and you put the healthy DNA. Clear? So, to correct sickle cell anemia and this is also called as or a very new type of Cas9 enzyme which is there. So, here in this Fn Cas9, you are using your healthy DNA from a specific bacterium and you are also using a new Cas9 protein and the mechanism is all the same. Cutting and fixing and all is the same. So you also have a guide RNA, you have all that mechanism. It's exactly the same, just that it's used to treat sickle cell anemia and these are the factual infos. Next. <coughs> Just keep a note of this. I'll take this topic once I teach you T cells. Okay, when we do immunity, we'll come back to this. Okay, because I need to tell you some basics. Okay, now moving on to transcriptome. Okay, this is a previous year UPSC question, by the way. Um, till now, we were going on talking about the term genome. And what happens in a genome? In a genome, you are taking, or so you have the entire genetic material, you are doing genome sequencing, you are finding out the code. Now, understand, if all the RNA molecules of a cell or tissue, including your mRNA, those were coded out, that is called as transcriptome. Got it. The same process when you do for DNA, you call it your genome. Now for all the RNA molecules and what all RNA are there, you have the normal RNA, you have the messenger RNA which is there. So if you're going to code for all of that, what is the code base pairs and all of it and you write it down or you create a database for it, this is called as a transcriptome. So a transcriptome is the complete set of RNA molecules in a cell or tissue including mRNA. RNA, tRNA and other non-coding RNA 
that are produced by the genetic material of an organism. Your takeaway is any RNA which is there formed as part of the genetic material of the organism will be part of the transcriptome. So if they ever want to confuse you, they will use some other, for example, guide RNA. We, we, we just talked about in CRISPR-Cas9. Will that be part of the transcriptome? Guide RNA, how did you create? Guide RNA is something you are creating based on the transcriptome in the person's body. Got it? There is a certain part which is defective. To identify that defective part, I am creating an RNA outside. That will not be part of the or it is not produced by the genetic material of the organism. So, your guide RNA is, will not be part of the transcriptome. So, remember this, all other kinds of RNA produced by the genetic material of the organism will be part of this list. Clear? Is that clear? Okay. You can ideally say it is the complement of the genome because in the genome you have all the DNAs. How do you create the, again I told you, in the transcription process what happens? You are creating a complement of whatever is there in your DNA. Remember, so in the DNA there is a code ATGCA. If the messenger RNA is what? The complement of this and then you have the uh, next one coming in as your RNA. So ideally even if they say a transcriptome is the complement of the genome, that is also correct. Is that clear at the back? Okay. Now, the current affair to this is this part, pan transcriptome. Now, just like we sit and said like there is a human genome project or anything, wherein you are sitting and trying to sequence the genome for several individuals, in pan transcriptome, it is a reference that contains genetic material from different individuals. So, what you do is, you will go about, take maybe 1000 individuals, see what all RNA is there in them, create a reference RNA using it. And that is called as pan transcriptome. Pan means all, common in that sense. Got it? So, your body will have a single transcriptome, wherein you or all the RNA can be coded. Pan transcriptome will have the reference or whatever I am collecting as a reference from a group of individuals. Got it? Even so, any point I mentioned for transcriptome will be applicable for pan transcriptome also. So, if that will also have messenger RNA, rRNA, no, non-coding RNA, all of that will be there in your pan transcriptome also. <sighs> Immunotherapy, I'll deal with later. Now, moving on to a very recent discovery that is there, which is your base editing. Base editing, again, understand, it is at the most minutest level that you are creating the change. What are your bases? You have adenine, thiamine, guanine, cytosine. I told you only when they occur in that specific sequence and specific points is where it will code for things. Even if I change one particular code, that entire sequence will not code for the one that is needed. So in base editing, what they are trying to do is, and this is specifically to treat this disease called as T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia where they discovered that it is in your genetic code when, see ideally, uh, before we go into the topic, you all have heard about cancer, right? Cancer can be caused by several things, but at the cellular level or at the genetic level, what actually happens that leads to cancer? It's not that we are, for example, there will be a code just like that and it will get, just get expressed. When we are maybe born, we might not have a cancerous genetic code in us. But what normally happens is, I just told you the entire DNA process. One thing that happens on a daily basis in our body is DNA replication. Wherein our cells die off, we have to have new cells 
when new cells are there you need new you have to have the dna copied exactly the same right see it's not like each time you will get new set of dna you have one set of dna that set of dna has to be expressed in your all cells which means even when a cell dies off or a cell is, has reached its lifetime the dna has to be carried forward through the new cells also how does that happen the dna gets replicated dna gets replicated in a very simple beautiful process where you have a double strand you will have the enzyme coming in they will split the strand and each specific strand for example there is atgca there there was already a complementary thing associated with it once you split it what happens is now there is a single atgca standing over there the complement is also there with this atgca the body will create an other strand complementary to the one that is there clear so there is now dna replication that has happened so from one set of dna you have two separate forms getting created now when this process happens ideally it should all go fine but sometimes it's the body when you just like we think of copying the assignment it's all okay a b c you are copying copying sometimes you just get distracted with something and instead of some word you write something else now in our case in the body's case the distraction can happen due to several things the distraction is not physically the body getting distracted the distraction can happen maybe at that particular point there is some other material that comes in there is some other exposure that is there maybe some uv radiation has happened some other exposure has happened wherein the body cannot clearly identify what i have to code for so the body will code for something that is in an erroneous manner now unfortunately if that newly coded thing is a cancer causing gene or cancer causing when i am saying what actually happens for example ideally the healthy genetic code would have been a t g c and here you have t a c g got split they created two copies of this and everything but in the process what happened is so you now suppose this specific code codes for the fact now this is a code that is there it codes for the fact that in our body when one cell is there it gets split or it gets uh, reproduced or propagated it will lead to two cells if this is the code that is there and until now our body has been healthily following it but now some change has happened something got added or something got deleted now you are ending up with two extra things or something over there which means maybe what happens is this code would code for uncontrolled division of cells okay when you add this it can be uncontrolled division it can be anything but you have to imagine that is why it's called as such a what you say rare at the same time yet so common got it this happens and that person's body suddenly will start expressing this particular genetic part and instead of cell dividing from 1 to 2 you will have maybe uncontrolled division but will we ever know it at that point no maybe at this particular point that i am talking to you maybe there's something in my body happening like that but we will not know it got it so now understand when you have such a formation you also know right now this has happened because of these bases so if i want to control this uncontrolled division i just can go and correct these bases which are there and that is what happens in your base editing so to treat the specific kind of t cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia which is a type of blood cancer what you do is you go and edit the base which has caused so you need to understand to find out where that error has happened and to correct that base is a very tedious process you must be wondering it's so simple right see if this technique is there this is the this is the ideal way you just have to find out the base go correct it the person will not have the cancer expressing gene but the difficult part is you have to find that exact base where the error happened and how will you find out where the exact base the error has happened to know that you will have to have a reference you should know what ideally was the correct base 
you have to have the original assignment to know which is the one where the, the error happened. So this is why you have now genome sequencing happen so that you have the reference over there so that now you can find out the different bases and engage in base editing. Is this clear? Is this, the entire thing has come to a complete circle at this point. Now, few extra current affairs related to this. First thing is your biotech Kisan scheme. Uh, understand biotech Kisan scheme was started way back in 2017. But this year in the budget and in the previous budget also, they have given so much of importance for it. And they have also identified 15 agroclimatic zones and aspirational districts in the country. Again, Biotech Kisan primarily says you have the farmers in the country. The farmers in the country have to be aided with the biotechnological applications which are there. So it is basically a connect between the biotechnological research foundations and everything and the farmers of the country. It's called Biotech Kisan scheme. One point that is important over here. The Biotech Kisan scheme specifically notes this plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. Again, we had discussed previously a class of things called as bio fertilizers. In environment, we had discussed this idea called as bio fertilizers. Now, the concept basically is that you are using certain biological implements like bacteria, fungus, and everything to improve the fertility for the plants which are there. So, this biotech Kisan scheme specifically talks about rhizobacteria, which is your root level bacteria which is there, which can be used to increase plant growth. So this is a class of bio fertilizers. I want you to understand biotech Kisan scheme is not just for biotechnological applications. It's anywhere where any kind of innovations in biology happens to reach it out to the farmer. You can use the biotech Kisan scheme. Okay, moving on. Biocomputers. Again, biocomputers and the concept of Zedo bots are very much interrelated. So, again, the terms that you see over there, they can actually intermix it. What is the idea of biocomputers? Biocomputers work on the idea of organoid intelligence. Again, what is organoid intelligence? See, we might think our brain is the part that gives us the intelligence, but it just so happens that Every organ in our body, be it our lungs, our heart, our liver, has a learning capacity and has a capacity to create something new. Which means each organ in our body, each cell in our body has an intelligence of its own. So in biocomputers, what you are trying to do is, you take up or you create mini brains using human stem cells wherein what you do is you take the human stem cells in the case of the xenobots you were taking the frog stem cells in the case of the biocomputer you're taking the human stem cells you're changing features in it so that you can create brain cells and in the brain cells as i told mentioned to you earlier you're studying the impact of it so only difference between xenobot and biocomputers is what kind of stem cells are used in the case of xenobots it's organic external foreign organisms which are there in this it is the human organisms so you're creating mini brains up to a size of 4 mm built using human stem cells and you're trying to understand the intelligence that this specific organ uses so nowadays the research i was just looking into it what they try to do is they create these structures of 4 mm they will give a stimuli like for example light at a very brightness so how do the cells react over there uh, you're giving some information showing that information again how do these cells react so based on this they're trying to learn memory sensory perception etc so this is the concept of biocomputers those are mini brains created using stem human stem cells clear next one very important topic for this year uh, indian biological data center and normally I, I've checked out the materials, they all have just mentioned casually some information related to it. Uh, we need to look at least two, three facts related to it. So again, in India, we have had, uh, for, for example, if you're collecting some germ plasm from animals, 
we have an organ um, grouping for that what was it in your environment class i had told you this for example germ plasm no i'm asking there is something do you remember i to told you something called as lecons anyway if you don't remember just keep this in your mind see in uh, for example in uh, in india if an organism is undergoing some extinction or not extinction vulnerability or endangered man but you need to recreate the organism even if one day it all goes extinct you can con con extract the germ plasm germ plasm primarily means it can be anything it can be the hair it can be the dna molecules whatever it is and you keep it stored in some place that happens via the organization that i have mentioned over there but you do not have an organization wherein all the data that you get from all this biological ideas for example when i'm looking at the tiger's genome i'm understanding okay the tiger has this particular code for this kind of a feature for its fast speed there is a code like this i have a lot of data coming in from it i don't have a national repository for it and thus we right now have created something called as the indian biological data center which is the first national repository for life science data in india so any data that we get from any of our genome sequencing any of our transcriptome everything will get stored in this indian biological data center it's supported by the department of biotechnology and again tomorrow when we study supercomputing you will understand india is not that great when it comes to supercomputing but uh, in this particular case we are using a four petabyte supercomputer called as brahm okay keep a note of this also okay because you need you're storing in so much of data now you cannot store it in your windows laptop which is there okay so you have to store it into supercomputer so that is why you have the four petabyte supercomputer bram that is being utilized by the indian biological data center okay now we move on to quickly close the door can you just close the door over there <laughs> first uh one category of topics that i feel could be important this year uh imaging techniques okay have you done this in your class okay so we'll have to look into it uh see in our body as we have our right now if anyone's ever gone to a hospital especially a private hospital you would have been subjected to almost all of these imaging techniques which are there okay so you have ultrasound you have x ray you have mri you have ct you have pet if you are they find you are looking very rich and all then you will go to even the pet scan which is there so these are all the different kinds of imaging techniques our point over here is not to study all of them but few of the ones we going to compare and study this the reason being uh, every year uh, if you look at the upsc trend they pick something from really ancient times okay ideally imaging techniques if i look at the current affairs of it two or three current affairs have come which we'll be discussing regarding it but the concept of it you will have to know so we're going to compare and study it i would urge you to make a table for this okay and write only the important points not to re the copy this entire table out there so we first start with we're going to deal with x ray ct mri ultrasound and pet scan okay and the most important of it being your x ray ct mri the first three of it first ones in the case of x ray you have to understand you are specifically using x rays itself okay so what is the quality of these x rays these are ionizing radiations okay this is a major differentiating factor between all of these techniques x ionizing means what somewhere close by wherein x rays are very you have the energy of these rays you are getting exposed to it at this point what happens is these radiations very unintentionally when it enters into our body has the ability to recharge our cells also 
now that's not an ideal scenario okay because our cells normally itself are going on and creating mutations and everything when x rays are there obviously they're getting charged they're like oh, fine okay now i don't need any enzyme i will just go create all these different mutations that i want so ionizing radiations are those high energy radiations that can create an impact into the cell structures and cell genetic codes which are there so x rays are ionizing in nature but on the good side of it it's quick it's painless and you don't if you have to see the internal structure your bones especially and all you can use these things why can you see the bones using x ray can x ray pass through the bones no cannot x ray cannot pass through the bones it gets reflected that is the point wherein you can see these images okay so x ray is that next coming into ct scan ct again though the machine and all have changed again here you use x rays of not one wavelength but several several wavelength so even in your ct scan what happens is series of x rays are given only the difference being so for example in the x ray what happens is you going you're lying down and something comes and it just takes like a picture has been taken but in the case so when you take a picture if you ever seen an x ray you will see that one like 2d picture of it out there okay but in the case of a ct what happens is one area will be there they create the images from different different sides okay thus you will see as a whole when they pick, put it together you will get like a 3d image sort of a thing so it's x ray itself but much more clearer clarity images which are there in the case of a ct scan so ct again you have x rays so for example you will have your ionizing radiations over there but again on the out good part of it is that everything you can see you can see blood you can see the blood vessels everything can be there in the x ray you cannot see with it with that much of clarity this is the reason why when you take an x ray and they are not able to find out they go and say you have to just get a ct also done to cl clearly get for example if there is a rupture or anything they will ask you to get a ct also now coming into something that we again use commonly which is your ultrasound so these both use x rays itself now coming to ultrasound ultrasound again uses high frequency sound waves to do the imaging now the good part of it is what high it might be high frequency but they are not high energy therefore your ultrasounds are non ionizing in nature okay so out of if you ask me out of these three which is the better method in case of the ionizing factor in case of the ionizing factor it is the ultrasound because you are using high frequency sound waves <laughs> when i when you get the slides i have the I, at the side of it i have mentioned what it is used to diagnose also just go through that list i'm not discussing that in detail because most of it you might be aware x ray and all i don't have to tell you what it is used to diagnose but then you can just go into once you get the slides go into the details of what this is it detects now moving on to mri mri is a interesting idea wherein you've dealt with x rays you've dealt with sound waves now you have something called as your magnetic waves okay now again there's no such thing as it is we look into the world right now it cannot be something just called as magnetic waves the concept is that in your mri you have huge magnets placed and again a little bit of physics over there when you have an electric field that passes into an entire cylindrical magnetic structure you will have some waves produced from it okay so you cannot go out and say can i have magnetic waves here but you will if you have an electric field and a magnet with you you can create a magnetic field so if anyone's ever been in an mri that huge cylinder around you is a huge magnet which is kept at very cool in temperatures how many of you got an mri ever okay now god forbid let not any of you have any chance to get the mri <laughs> so again the concept is related to that now coming into the last one that we have to discuss this is your pet scan pet scans what happens is 
until now we have not taken in any of these methods you have not taken anything inside to do the scanning okay everything is imaging from the outside in the case of the pet scanning what happens is you will ingest or you will take in radioactive drugs called as tracers now don't think you will become spider man after that it will be very weak radioactive uh, drugs which are there the idea is when you take certain drugs which are called as tracers it will go to certain parts react with certain things and illuminate certain parts in our body those parts which normally in any of other of your other methods will not be very clearly visible so your pet scan uses extremely high costly tracers you have to ingest it you it and obviously after that it will get excreted out of your body also but for that specific amount of time it will go and illuminate what uh, that specific part and it will you will get that picture of the tissue or the muscle or whatever is there in a clear manner commonly when you are doubtful about cancer alzheimers disease and all that you will confirm it with a pet scan so you have to understand it's a confirmatory thing that happens at the end but the problem over here is it is not i would ionizing in nature because it's not a high energy thing or anything you're consuming a radioactive drug and because of this it might have side effects okay so these are all the different techniques now apart from that there is something called as nuclear magnetic resonance so mri right now i told you is magnetic resonance imaging okay you something called as your nuclear magnetic resonance and in your nuclear magnetic resonance what you are using is see in the earlier case in your normal mri what happened i told you there are magnetic waves but how because you have an electric field and therefore magnetic waves here you have the very same setup but what happens is instead of electric waves you are using radio frequency waves radio waves radio waves normal in your in your entire spectrum if you take you have micro radio and all that so instead of an electric field you are having a group of radio waves that is there so this is the sole difference between an mri and a nmri okay so if even a detailed question comes on that level i want you to be clear with it mri uses electric field related magnetic waves nmri uses radio frequency related magnetic field so rest of the process is very similar okay you will have the magnet it will just be that instead of an electric field what you are passing is your radio waves and when radio waves are passed through they will create a kind of field over here and these magnetic particles will interact and thus we will be able to see images clearly the crux and the difference one more thing is your normal mri we use in our scanning things your nmri see again you have to understand when it comes to your magnetic this electric field and everything we have living cells this is the reason why when you have this entire magnetic thing an electric field related to it there should be some way this is getting imaged in our body right it's because these things can actually come and get reflected by our cells but in the case of a non living thing you cannot use these electric fields and that is why you are using radio waves which means your nmr is not most commonly used to determine molecular structure of your inorganic particles purity of inorganic particles in all of these things you will be using nmr okay now this is where the current affair comes in so i hope it's uh, the base is clear we discussed different imaging techniques there can be a sole question based on that imaging technique itself if they are asking a question it will probably be on the waves that are used or on the ionizing nature of it so if and otherwise it will be a discussion about mri and nmr now the current affair over here is this last year this is this is important because india is very proud of this particular achievement what we've done is 
there is a lot of complaint that comes about with our honey is quite adulterated okay it's adulterated with sugar syrup so, and this is led to a lot of our export and all getting getting rejected back at this point your fssa has come up with the idea of using nmri technique to determine the purity of honey got it it is in this relation that nuclear magnetic resonance can be important and now what has happened is they have made nmr tests mandatory in india for checking the for any any export you are using honey means you have to mandatorily get an nmri test on the honey part because it is there so they'll be able to find out if it's adulterated or not so first thing is they used this test they made it mandatory they also started india's first honey testing lab which was set up by the national dairy development board to do these tests because you cannot have nmri given to all the parts of the country it's a very expensive machine which is there so they have put the testing lab over here so i do feel this and all will be relevant for upsc that nmr technique will be crucial and this lab is the only one this particular lab at this particular point this is the only lab that is accredited for by fssi to actually conduct this testing so nmr honey purity mandatory fssi regulation okay <sighs> just put the picture i thought i'll have to you know you don't have to go into the details of uh, any of these techniques because if they ask it will be a very primary level information that is there unless it's nmri then you can expect a detailed test trans fats mm. time duration would be very similar to mri i think it will be 1 hour one hour the rest of the method is all the same mri whatever they using in mri it's very similar should be one one and a half hour let me i just one minute okay. 45 minutes to one hour trans fat okay broadly i know again this is one area you all will be experts on let's try uh, so you all can only guide me what all are the different types of fats that are there saturated unsaturated that's it anything else anything else okay what is the primary difference between saturated just tell me saturated what is saturated fat what is it saturated with hydrogen it's saturated with hydrogen what is the um, feature or you know the common distinguishing feature of a saturated fat why is it yeah soluble single distinguishing like if i had to have three four fats over here and if i see saturated fat what stage would it be in right now i don't know but in normal room temperature solid okay see now this is the point here what happens is you have a class of fats called as saturated fats which on a chemistry level it is the fact that these are having all these single bonds because these are having single bonds it's very easy to go and form a relation with hydrogen and they have so much of hydrogen all around them so it's a good thing second thing is it is solid at room temperature third thing is because it's all saturated with hydrogen it doesn't become that easy to go rancid rancid means it does not get damaged very quickly why because why again why do things go rotten why is the banana that was very fresh looking yesterday is black in color today why it's rotten what has happened in that banana how did it go stale oxidation okay it got oxidized means there are some particles in it which reacted with the oxygen 
and there was nothing in it to prevent it. Thereby, it started decaying. So here, the catch over here is here you have hydrogen. You do not have anything more to go and react with oxygen over there. So these things are all saturated. All the bonds have all hydrogens. So even if oxygen is lying around, they're like no place for you guys. We are not having any place. So it does not go rancid. This is the important part. Let me ask you: Are saturated fats healthy or unhealthy? Huh? Unhealthy? Why? Okay, how did you determine uh, wh what is the basis that you're saying it's something is healthy or unhealthy? We have two factors. You have something called as LDL and HDL. What is LDL? Yeah, low density lipids and the other one is your high density lipids. So here what happens is this is what we call as good cholesterol, bad cholesterol and everything. So in, in the case of your saturated ones, it can raise both LDL and HDL. This is a very important point I want you to keep in mind. See, you can say something is completely unhealthy when it is raising your bad cholesterol and it is bringing down your good cholesterol. In that case, you can say that thing is entirely bad. But here what is happening is it's raising your good cholesterol and it is raising your bad cholesterol. Got it. So it is raising. This is a very crucial point over here. It can raise both your LDL and HDL. So in comparison to certain other fats, you cannot completely term it as an unhealthy fat. It is unhealthy because it is raising the bad cholesterol. But you cannot completely say it's unhealthy because it's also raising the good cholesterol along with it. Next thing is your unsaturated fats. The unsaturated ones are the common ones that we say it will lower the LDL and increase the HDL. Means these are the healthy ones which are there. Unsaturated ones don't have so much of they don't remain, remain this hydrogen, hydrogen and everything. But they also are their drawback is what? Because they are unsaturated they can go rancid easy. They might be healthy but they can become stale quickly. So now you need to find a middle path and the middle path comes in the form of trans fat. But again I want to add one more point over there and you take your unsaturated who's saying something I'm going on hearing Rancid means going bad, uh, like uh, stale, rotten. Like for sometimes if you notice certain oils and all will have a very bad smell coming in from after that. That's because that thing has gone stale after a point. Everything has an expiry date, right? So rancid means rotten. <clears throat> again, trans fat, because trans fat is a star topic. Again, to clarify, trans fat can be artificial and natural. Natural trans fats are quite harmless. Okay, they do not cause severe health impact. Artific the natural ones which are there are commonly seen in your nuts and everything. In your meat products, you see natural trans fats, but they don't have a huge health impact. The problem is with the artificial trans fat. Again, clarifying if they say all kinds of trans fats are harmful for the body. No, it's just your artificial ones which are harmful for the body. And in the artificial ones, why does it... So, when I'm saying trans fat, what is the idea? They are trying to create or it's a type of these... Um, you, do, you want certain things not to go bad. But you also want that thing to remain at a particular stable condition. So what you do is you try to partially hydrogenate it. Now the problem with partially hydrogenating it is you are putting in hydrogen, you create this. When you cook, even in trans fat artificially just made and kept over there, it's not doing any harm. But the problem is when you start using it for cooking, what happens is this is partially hydrogenated. It's that midway. You have some single bonds which are having hydrogen. The others are just lying out there open. Which means what? They can easily go and combine with more and more things. Thereby creating unwanted particles in the food we eat. 
and these particles which we eat are oxidizing elements got it whenever our body is exposed to oxidizing elements oxidizing i told you it's basically oxygen coming in this affects every element in our body be it the blood be it the lungs whatever it is it will get affected this is the problem it's partially hydrogenated thereby giving the scope to create oxidants and because oxidants are created it's harmful for the body because oxidants means it's this oxygen giving out there it will go and easily react with any other free particle which is there in our body thereby causing higher levels of bad cholesterols is this clear all clear okay cool now i have just put because again last year i think 2021 there was a question of um, um, different kinds of plastics put as an option okay it all looks the same you know, terephthalene poly that this thing and all that so again it's very confusing for to pick an option here i've just put out all the names of the healthy fats which are there in our surroundings and which are there commonly in the food so healthy fats are mono unsaturated fats poly unsaturated fats alpha linolenic acid which is an omega 3 fatty acid linolenic acid which is an omega 6 fatty acid omega 3 and omega 6 are the ones which are extremely healthy even in the case of people who have heart diseases and everything it's safe for them to use the omega 3 and omega 6 your olive oil and all fall into this category so if at all they give you an entire list and ask you to choose which among these are healthy fats all of this is there mono unsaturated poly unsaturated alpha linolenic and your linolenic acid now the regulations that have come this year regulations are quite strict the first thing is fssa has capped the trans fat in oils to 3 percentage by 2021 and 2 percentage by 2022 from the current levels which are 5 percentage this is the first thing the second thing has been done by who who have called for the complete elimination of industrially produced trans fatty acids by the global food chain from 2023 and the good fact over here is india is going to achieve this target or india has already achieved this target close by at 2022 so right now in industrially produced trans fatty acids we are we have completely eliminated it so fssa has brought that regulation also i want you to again be clear over here this is capping no if for your general produce which is there for your normal uh, palm oil or anything which is there this is industrially produced trans fatty acids wherein you are using it for your normally processed foods which are there which comes from factories this is the elimination that is the reduction these are all things i do feel because everyone knows everything about trans fat if they want to get a difficult question they will pick on these technicalities <clears throat> moving into another concept called as i am not discussing all those different a lot of these uh, what you say campaigns which is purple heart campaign there's a lot of things that are happening with trans fat i was i'm thinking you guys might be already aware of it because i saw that in sir's slides your you you had a previous snt class right in those slides i had seen it so i figured i wouldn't have to discuss that again coming to the concept of immunity and we have to discuss an important technique also here first thing is we will be discussing few different types of immunity the immune system and very very important vaccinations which are there first of all starting with the concept of immunity what all different types of immunity are there in human body innate and acquired okay any other type active passive that is also another type first innate immunity and your let's have a discussion about that what is innate means that is something yeah it is internally there so innate immunity is a non specific type of defense that is present at the time of birth it can be physical barriers like skin mucus coating physiological barriers like acid in the stomach saliva in the mouth tears in the eyes etc 
cellular barriers like leukocytes that is your wbc macrophages etc and cytokine barriers like interferons what are interferons others all i <laughs> you will anyway figure out so what are interferons previous upsc question anyone anyone Uh, nobody knows okay fine uh, see whenever in our body what happens is you have your normal cells which are there and sometimes foreign particles enter into our body okay so now when i'm saying foreign particles enter i want you to understand they could not be stopped by any of these other ones physical physiological or anything and they've entered into it can even be something like it need not always be a virus or a bacteria it can be any foreign particle which is there the moment a foreign particle comes into our body our cells give out a specific type of protein and now you all are well enlightened to know how did the cell give out this protein because there is a specific code in it which says that okay foreign particle comes you give out a protein related to this and that protein can go and attack now understand it is different from your wbc or your rbc or any of these other things you have white blood cells which normally can go and attack a foreign particle but you also have these proteins which will get released and those proteins can also go and attack these foreign particles so interferons are those proteins that get generated from our cells when there is a foreign particle entering into our body and that we don't have to take any extra therapy for it we get it along with the different types of innate immunity that is there got it so interferons are a type of proteins if basic idea is the type of proteins that gets created at the presence of a foreign particle uh now okay Hmm. Now we were talking about innate immunity. That is something that we already have at the time of our birth. Then we have some other kinds of immunity called as your acquired immunity. And the acquired immunity is quite pathogen specific. If they want to even confuse you, this is the thing: innate immunity, which is there in our body. For example, tears in our eyes. It will not be like okay, is bacteria there or virus there? It will just be there. Whatever foreign particle, it will get eliminated. But in the case of acquired immunity, it is. pathogen specific means for specific kinds of things there will be a very specific reaction related to it and this is characterized by memory of the body cells now understand this memory of the body cells is initiated in two levels there is something called as a primary response now that is the point where keep this concept very clear in mind your body gets first exposed to a particular pathogen okay it comes in at that point the body is like oh okay fine let's we just identified all of it they will not or it will be a very low intensity reaction against it okay because the body doesn't know who has come in it doesn't know if it's covid or aids or anything they are like okay fine something has come in so body will have a very minimal reaction towards it now when you have the minimal reaction so understand your primary response is always of low intensity it might take a longer time for it to get over but it will be of low intensity when your body is first exposed to that foreign particle now that is over and after a period of time your body has fought against it it will be in a very low manner but it has fought against it after few times or after some time what happens is again that same particle comes inside your body this at that point your body is not seeing it for the first time now body is remembering very well the first time it came okay we made a wrong call it was not that uh, what you say as we thought it was fairly harmless but it turned out to be harmful we need to have intensified response which means your primary response will be of low intensity the second time the body is exposed to that same pathogen it will be a highly intensified response 
body will be like fine with that same person has come we have to attack it at any cost but how does it attack it's because these cells have a memory of those particles that were there how how do these cells have memory can you please think on all these concepts and tell me what, what happened what ha what would have happened that these cells suddenly had memory of this one how did that memory get created obviously there is not anyone logging in data over there how any idea because you have to know that that's the base of it proteins again what has happened is the body does not remember the foreign particle the body once it comes into our body what happens is this will start having some reaction in our body at this particular point some proteins get secreted in our body and that is what the body remembers suddenly when this thing comes in it's the body is secreting some kind of particles as i told you have interferons and everything it is releasing some kind of particles out there so now the body knows okay the same guy has come back so your idea over here in your memory the memory is not of the pathogen but of the proteins that get released because of the pathogen and that is what the body recollects now this process of entire memory and fighting and everything happens in a stage by stage manner where you have certain cells called as your t cells these t cells help produce certain other category of cells called as your b cells b lymphocytes and those b cells in turn produce something called as your antibodies and these antibodies fight against those particles which are there so which means that in any of these levels you can have for example when some organism tries to attack us see ideally what is happening t cell b cell antibody now you have a foreign some microorganism that has come in microorganism will have a very clear plan of action it will not be like okay i'll attack heart i'll attack lungs it will be like okay my idea is to go and stop t cell production my idea is to go and stop b cell production so what will happen is this will specifically impede any of these immunity cells from being formed that is from where the body takes much more time to fight against it got it so at one point that will the body will cross over it so suppose there are 10000 b cells in our body the microorganism comes and attacks all the b cells over there but at that point the body will try to create more and more t cells which will in a again create more and more b cells this is that entire infection stage and finally what comes out of it okay so these are few basics so broadly if you look at it the immune system in our body is composed of your bone marrow and thymus certain other organisms like spleen lymph nodes tonsils pears patches of small intestine etc then you have your white blood cells map different kinds of white blood cells which is macrophages b cells and t cells b cells t cells macrophages are all different types of white blood cells okay so again get that clear if they just say white blood cells are what provides us immunity that is also correct <clears throat> vaccines now we told very clearly over here so this memory of our cells is very very significant this memory is what has uh, helped our body fight against all these infections now at times when there are common things which are like common cold or anything we are already exposed to it so we know but what if there is something that is quite rare that our body is not exposed on a regular basis our body might not have proper memory of it so vaccines are those methods by which you are inducting specific immunological memory your body normally have, will have memory see you cannot be exposed to all the diseases to get all the memory of it no 
okay that is not a very smart way to think about it right like okay i need to have immunity against malaria so let me get malaria that is not the right way so instead of that what happens is you train the body to be having a memory of it and this training or this induction of that memory to incorporate that memory it's called as vaccines so now let me just ask you if i have to incorporate when um, what you say suppose there's one vaccine which is there if i have to incorporate a memory of some kind how all can i do it think of it i kept on right now telling foreign particle and i said our body identifies this foreign particle because of certain things getting secreted when, once it enters into our body now what all minute levels can that microorganism be broken down up to a point where even a small part of it even if it enters into our body the body will have a response against it which means you don't have to for example there's a virus i don't have to put the entire virus in it i can take one small protein of the virus i can take a if the virus is having some rna or dna or something i can create take that i can create even for example if there is some genetic material other than that i can use it which means all i want is something that reflects that the identity of that virus but it has to reflect the identity i cannot just get an outside coating which is very similar to all the other viruses okay so vaccines as you have to understand are divided into all these different types based on what material are you using to start that memory process of the body okay so the first one called as your live attenuated vaccines i want you to again make a table for this because mm, in india we are having so many different drives going on we have against malaria we have drives against tb all these things are going on they will not ask you a simple question they will ask you these technical terms related to it okay so let's just get it clear live means from here you can very clear that whatever particle is there virus whatever it is there it is alive okay but attenuated attenuated means you have the virus now even the virus has a genetic material right so you take the virus you look at the genetic material and you are like okay there is one part in the genetic material of the virus that says that okay i will propagate very very rapidly so we nicely remove that part and instead we put in one say that i will be there in the body like i will just be there i will propagate once i can put a code we are capable of doing that we have done that in this way the virus which was very energetic going to infect the entire body you have reduced the effect of it to just a name sake sort of a thing now it's it looks like virus and all but it does not have the capability or intensity of normal viral capacity got it so it's live but it's attenuated attenuated means you've reduced the energy over here and these so in these ones you're using the whole virus okay you're not making any parts of it you're just reducing the intensity and this is what we are using in all these different uh, um, vaccines measles mumps rubella the mmr vaccine which is there the chicken pox has a specific vaccine that is created the rota virus vaccine india has an innovation in that have you what is first of all what does rota virus cause this you have to know there is an indian innovation in this it's just 3 4 years old okay just tell me what rota virus causes rota virus causes severe dysentery in children below the age of 5 and it kills them it's fatal okay and indian innovation in this is the vaccine rota vac okay we've created this private firm itself but then we've created rota vac and rota vac is part of what happened children in the below the age of 
um saying something okay. we said rota back and then what did i say no something as i had ah in the universal immunization program that we have we have incorporated this particular vaccine also we are using rotavac in our uh, universal immunization program so again if you didn't know that keep a note of it so uh, keep a list of these names okay all these are live attenuated vaccines next is your non live vaccines non live vaccines means you the virus is not there it's not functioning as it is you have the virus the casing of it the entire material is all there but it is a dead virus so non live vaccines are used in your inactivated polio vaccine hep a hepatitis a vaccination and rabies which is there again the huge um, outcry against this particular inactivated polio vaccine is because mm you have to know something about virus virus around us right now is there and virus is not technically living okay virus will get alive when it comes in interaction with a bodily fluid which is there and when you create this particular polio vaccine you are using inactivated virus which is there sometimes and this has happened previously in india also what has happened is if the storage of this is not correct or even if the creation is not correct this inactivated polio vaccine once you give it to the person once it enters into the body fluid it will actually cause polio got it because this virus is not actually dead the virus would have just been inact like you know like dormant so once it comes in interaction with the body fluids it might cause polio and this has happened in india that is why there's a lot of concern against inactivated polio vaccine but right now again polio is one of those diseases which we have eliminated from india polio is again in news for one more thing not related to india but uh, keep in mind uh, in the american region wild polio is now making a comeback okay so polio what organism causes polio bacteria virus what causes polio virus i just spoke about polio virus i still have a doubt about it uh so again now that is your non live vaccines moving on to the next one toxoid vaccines toxoid vaccines again what happens is when you have certain bacteria or virus or fungi or whatever what happens is sometimes they cause harm to our body because they release some toxins once they enter into our body so for example if you take the diphtheria one which is there the microorganism enters into our body and it creates a toxin and that toxin is the one that is harmful for the body so here now to create memory of it you take a part of the toxin you create the vaccine using the toxin from that organism in this way diphtheria and tetanus both of them are toxoid vaccines ha one minute has this been already taught to you because i didn't see this in your slides was it taught no okay fine okay then you have something not very relevant called as your sub unit vaccines in the sub unit vaccines what is happening is for example instead of taking part of like for example in the first one you took the entire virus second one you took dead but entire virus third one you took the toxin one part in the sub unit what you do is you take a little bit part of its genetic material little bit part of its nuclear casing so every component of that virus or bacteria you take small units of it and you create one specific kind of vaccine not very important but remember your whooping cough vaccine is created using this particular sub unit vaccines again i am now stressing on this because in india we have something called as an mmr vaccine we also have a dpt vaccine 
okay the dpt vaccine is one dose but it's given for diphtheria tetanus and pertussis diphtheria and tetanus have a toxoid element and your pertussis is a subunit vaccine so even in a single dose of vaccine you have these three elements being given understand that is the point because in the case of the mmr all of it was your live attenuated but in the dpt it's different strains it's with d and t diphtheria and tetanus are toxoid p is subunit vaccine clear okay. then you have another category called as your conjugate vaccines conjugate vaccines means for example uh, influenza okay influenza means you can have different types of it okay so at that point what they try to do is instead of just taking one there might be a specific one kind of influenza which is there influenza virus which is there but you know your body could be exposed to maybe five different kinds of influenza virus you create a vaccine using elements from these five different organisms understand the difference between subunit and conjugate is in the subunit for the same organism you are taking subunits of different different parts of it in conjugate you are taking different organisms taking parts of it and creating one vaccine thereby that would be effective against a range of such diseases for example influenza a influenza b influenza c these different types we would have an immunity against it again as i told you it's used against your hib that is haemophilus influenza type uh, virus which is there so these are your different broadly your different types of vaccines now i have a question for you if there is a particular vaccine out there can any like for example can everybody use that vaccine i mean can everybody anyone receive that vaccine is my question no no just because you have mmr vaccine or dpt vaccine doesn't mean that every single individual out there will be okay with accepting it when okay and uh, one thing is okay being okay with what you say uh, emotionally on one level but what i am talking about your body might not always accept vaccines especially seen in older age people what happens is you might have an adverse reaction against vaccines also so the point be not everyone can receive all types of vaccines <sighs> then until now we were dealing with very normal territory where it was feeling hungry yeah me also okay <laughs> good question very good question vaccines are not against only virus you can have bacterial you can have viral you can even have fungal elements based on which you can create vaccines the only question being the efficacy of these is little bit less so you can create vaccines on any of these levels which are there okay so the next topic that we have to discuss is dna vaccines now we had stopped with the idea that you have vaccines of different type you have uh, live attenuated vaccines non live vaccines etc now enter the idea of dna mrna rna these kind of vaccines so the clue is pretty much clear you are using the genetic material of that particular organism which is there like for example if it's a virus you and the virus has a specific strand of whatever genetic material you are making vaccines using that genetic material now the point about making vaccines using the genetic material is that the efficacy will be extremely high see the virus the outer covering and all can be similar to something else but the genetic material is unique to that very specific kind of virus so the efficacy is generally higher for any vaccines that use genetic material based uh, platforms so your dna mrna all these vaccines are much more efficient than your live attenuated non live conjugate vaccines etc 
Now, in this itself, you have to know. Okay, online guys, is my audio uh, clear and video visible to all of you? Okay, fine, cool. Uh, yeah. In this itself, the first vaccine that we are going to study is your DNA vaccines. You can just start looking at the diagram over here. See, um, in DNA vaccines can happen at two levels. One is a, if a particular microorganism which is there, if it's already having DNA as its genetic material, it's cool. So you just have to pick a part of that DNA, uh, this thing, uh, genetic material, create the vaccine with it. But it just so happens that a lot of your viruses don't have DNA as your genetic material. You have RNA as its genetic material. Again, I'm saying a lot, not all, but it's not a generalization or anything. You have viruses which can have DNA as its mater genetic material or RNA as its material. We are specifically talking in the case of such viruses which are having a single stranded RNA as its genetic material. In that case, what you do is you extract a part of that single stranded RNA and obviously if from DNA you can create RNA, using this RNA you reverse transcriptase it and you get a DNA strand. Whatever transcription process that earlier happened, you are reversing that entire thing and you create a DNA strand. Now that doesn't end over there. In this entire process what happens is this DNA strand is created and it, you cannot just hang it out and put it into a vaccine. Here, this DNA strand using certain techniques uh, like uh, DNA synthesizer, etc. What they do is they place it into something called as a plasmid. You know, for anything to be carried into our body, okay, you need a vector. In most of the cases, the most efficient and non-neutral kind of vector that is there is a plasmid. So, here in this plasmid, what do you do is that changed part whatever is there or that extra thing that the body has to identify you will put it at part of the plasmid the plasmid behaves like the vector vector means what something that carries something into the body and here this thing gets carried into or created into a vaccine and thus this vaccine is injected into our body so the thing is very simple either you pick dna directly from the organism if it is having a genetic material Otherwise, what you do is you pick the RNA, reverse transcript it to DNA, create all these processes wherein the DNA can be fixed into a plasmid and the plasmid is put into the vaccine and the vaccine is given to the person. Okay, so understand these vaccines use genetically engineered DNA molecules. Why is why am I calling it genetically engineered? In those cases where you have the RNA, you have to engineer the DNA. You have to create the DNA outside that are coded with the antigen against with the immune responses to be built. What does that mean? It just means that in that specific viral RNA, there would be a specific part which indicates, okay, this is this particular virus that is giving this kind of an antigen protein. That part is what we are picking. And that part we are creating the DNA and from the DNA we are creating this vaccine. This becomes important this year because of this current affair. Again, Indian innovation, very important. We've created something called as the Zycovid or Zycuvd, which is basically a plasmid DNA vaccine. It's the same thing. See, don't think plasmid DNA vaccine is new variety or anything. It's the same thing, plasmid DNA vaccine. We've done this under the vaccine discovery program supported by the uh, National Biopharma Mission. All of these things are important this year. National Biopharma mission is important. This plasmid DNA vaccine is important. This is a plasmid DNA vaccine against COVID. I hope that is obvious from the Zycovid name. So it's a DNA plasmid DNA vaccine against COVID created by the National Biopharma mission. So if they ever ask you this entire thing, the entire mechanism is given over here. Okay, And this is what I just explained to you. Now, another category of vaccines is your mRNA vaccines. Now, again, mRNA vaccines happen wherein, again, I have told you this. 
you have the situation where there is uh, in the beginning did you remember me telling you as and when we have can go into the minutest part is where this becomes good so mrna what you are doing is whatever virus which is there in that virus also there will be a messenger rna that is generated you are taking that messenger rna and creating a vaccine with it it just so happens that in these cases it's much more effective than a dna vaccine can anyone logically tell me why is mrna vaccine more effective than a dna vaccine any guesses i just told you what a dna vaccine is and i'm telling you messenger rna means you're using the messenger rna molecules and you are creating or whatever for example uh, you know taking that and creating the vaccine why do you think this would be more effective than the dna vaccine any guess based on your scientific minds Okay, you're saying uh, because in the mRNA stage, the next stage after mRNA is creating of RNA and then creating of protein. So this is a much more your chances of error are less. Is that what you're trying to say? Okay. Any other answer? Specificity. Good. Okay. Anything more? See, do you realize in the DNA vaccine we are genetically engineering the DNA, which is there. we there is an additional step we are not picking the rna which is directly there you take the rna and you are creating an artificial dna based on the rna which means here in this entire process there is a lot of human caution that is coming in on the contrary in the mrna vaccine all you are doing is picking the mrna directly from the cell and then as she mentioned right after the mrna what is the stage that you have you have the rna and the protein synthesis so based on the technique followed in both of these vaccinations like how you are creating it this is the reason why it's generally seen as mrna vaccines are more effective than your dna vaccines okay now national biopharma mission i'm going to see this mission coming in even when you read generally also your current affairs your government schemes and everything you're going to see this mission coming up national biopharma mission is again an industry academia collaborative mission for biopharmaceutical development in the country biopharmaceutical is again just you have your pharmaceutical drugs which are there you have certain biological components like for example your vaccines and everything also over there so this is an industry that encompasses all of it this national biopharma mission is something that has launched the innovate in india program get this clear innovate in innovate in india is a much older program okay but it is under the innovate in india program that this new vaccine discovery program based on which that zy covid got found out was created so you have innovate in india program and you have vaccine discovery program and again national biopharma mission is implemented in india by virac i told you again this is that organization which will come anywhere where this industry academy or collaboration comes in you will find birak coming in uh, i just found this as an interesting thing it is national biopharma mission and everything started at 2017 but 50 percentage of its funding comes from world bank it's not a solely indian government thing 50 percentage funding is from world bank so get that clear 2017 innovate in india program vaccine discovery program underneath zy covid got found underneath that zy covid is a dna vaccine all of these related just because we are on the pharmaceutical thing you do know um, this term api right yeah you all know it right acts active pharmaceutical ingredient okay just i just want you to keep that in mind it is that component which distinguishes what medicine for example if there is a dolo 650 or something whatever it is the active pharmaceutical component in it is your paracetamol or that chemical which makes that drug what it is okay 
uh, what is India's situation when it comes to active pharmaceutical ingredients? Do are we self-sufficient? Yeah, we import a large majority of it from outside. A major importer being China. Okay, fine. That that much is enough. You just clarity. COVID vaccines in total. I don't want you to learn any other thing. I just want you to look at two major columns over here. One is obviously the type, the company names which are there, the type and the storage. These are the important things. So the first one you have your, uh, ha have you dealt this in detail in class? You've done? No. Yes. No. Okay. Okay. Fine. I was under the impression this was dealt in detail. Anyway, it's all right. We have the table here. Anyway, we'll look through it. Uh, first one is your Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine. We all would have heard all these names coming out in news. So we know them, but we don't know actually what its points are. First one here in the AstraZeneca, you are using a genetically modified virus the vaccine's base compound. So what do you think would have been genetically modified in it? You are taking the COVID whatever virus that is there. You would be changing the code which allows for its faster propagation. Which means this is another kind of a live attenuated vaccine which is there. You are using a genetically modified virus and this can be stored at regular fridge temperature. Okay. Next one is your Moderna vaccine. The countries associated also you can notice by the flags. Again, this is an RNA vaccine. Or specifically if you look at it, it is an mRNA vaccine. And here the storage is minus 20 degrees Celsius. You can store it up to 6 months. This is your Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Again, mRNA vaccine, which is there. And here it is stored at minus 70 degree Celsius. So out of all these vaccines, this is the one that we cannot ideally use in our country. The reason being the very stringent storage conditions. Minus 70 degrees Celsius is not something that we can easily achieve in a tropical country like us. So, your Pfizer vaccine, though efficacy is very high, we cannot, we are not preferring it. Then finally, you have the Russian vaccine, which is your Gamaleya or your Sputnik 5 vaccine, which is there. Again, created using a viral vector. What do I mean when I'm saying a viral vector? What is the idea? Think about it, you will change the genetic code and you will put it inside. See, you are sending, you have to send it inside. It's a vaccine, right? So, the vector that is being used is also a viral case. This is the kind of thing. So, when they say viral vector platform or anything, it just means that you are using a virus as a vector and sending it into the body. Okay. So, this again is regular fridge temperature which is there. So, your Oxford University is AstraZeneca. And your Gamalaya is the one which regular fridge temperature it can be stored. But for some reason Gamalaya and Sputnik 5, I mean the Sputnik 5 was not largely preferred in a lot of the countries. Again, political reasons to do with it. Okay. <clears throat> now coming into the COVID vaccines of India. Let's first deal with this. We had primarily two kinds of vaccines which we all most of us got the doses of you had Covaxin and Covishield. Now let's start with the original or what was the innovation in it. First thing I'm going to read out we're talking about Covaxin first. Covaxin is an inactivated vaccine derived from a strain of SARS-CoV-2 virus. Inactivated activated vaccine which means what are we talking about over here we are talking about the categories where you have a non-live virus which is inactivated got it you remember the second type of vaccines which were there not the live attenuated ones the second category which is there this is what your co-vaccine was now once you read that look at this can you see the efficacy of it is non-available Again, the reason as I had told you, when you have the live attenuated or your non-live vaccines, in comparison, it is having a risk factor along with it. 
got it this is the reason why the efficacy of it cannot be studied in a proper manner in this short period of time so relate these two concepts inactivated vaccine not the efficacy is not available next thing it was developed by icmr national institute of virology and bharat biotech okay so this is your co vaccine uh, you don't have to remember the dosage and the storage temperature that is same for both of these vaccines you have two doses you have 2 degree to 8 degree celsius temperature storage what changes is the other factors so co vaccine is done so clearly we know it is not that it is a good it's a vaccine but not a great one then you had covid shield coming in covid shield if you look at it it is created from a chimpanzee adenovirus vector so let's try breaking it into parts first leave the chimpanzee part first let's look into the adenovirus part what actually is an adenovirus and this is also a previous upsc question uh, i believe in 20 one minute just give me a minute what exactly is your adenovirus okay first let me try breaking it into two parts there are two things there is an adenovirus and there is another type thing called as a retrovirus okay these are the two most preferred viral vector things which are there uh, now the what is the specific feature of the adenovirus adenovirus is a double stranded or the genetic material in adenovirus is a double stranded dna just like the normal dna which is there okay double stranded dna genome is what an adenovirus has the retrovirus quite unique in its sense has a single stranded dna very unique feature because we have not ever heard at until this point about a single stranded and whenever it's single stranded we constantly think it's an rna molecule but then here you are again introduced so if someone asks dna has to always be double stranded not necessarily you can have a single stranded dna in the case of a retrovirus anyway coming back to our point so you have commonly these two things out there you have an adenovirus and a retrovirus both of them are used normally as a viral vector idea being to transport it into the human body which is a human body or any body which is a we prefer adenovirus because the structuring of its genetic material is similar to the human genetic material which is there okay thereby the process also is a bit more simple retrovirus we normally don't use when it you have to transport it into a dna or a double stranded dna thing in the case of the single stranded retrovirus you either convert it into some other form like an rna or something and then choose it so retrovirus is out of question so this is your adenovirus it is a virus it is a vector it has a double stranded dna in this particular vaccine type which is covid shield what you have done is you have created a viral vector you are changing the for example you have the covid virus which is there you are taking the covid virus you are changing the genetic code in a way it will not propagate but you are taking its genetic code anyway and you will put it into a strand of adenovirus which is available in certain chimpanzees okay so you extract the adenovirus that is present in the chimpanzees take it out put the genetically coded thing over there create it as a viral vector and then create the vaccine using it this is why it's called as a chimpanzee adenovirus vector okay you have to derive it from somewhere right so you get the adenovirus component from the chimpanzee and you do it in this manner so this is 
and this is the important thing this was developed by university of oxford and your serum institute of india okay now you know in our list we had an oxford vaccine which is there this one so in some places you will see this is the indianized version of the astrazeneca vaccine also this is one line i have seen in a lot of places so if they ever want to pick it up from there this is created by oxford university but here you have oxford university and serum institute of india but you normally see covishield even being called as an indianized version of the astrazeneca vaccine okay now the efficacy of it has has been seen as almost 70 percentage efficacy they we were able to establish that because of this very specific technique that we have used over there oh now if this is clear that doesn't end there we started with covaxin and covi shield but then right now we have so many current affairs doing the rounds based on uh, the different kinds of uh, innovations that we have done in india let's start one by one first thing is called as the corbi vax okay corbi vax again is a vaccine that is made up with the spike protein that is there on the virus if you all have you all remember corona virus uh, it had these like spikes quite stylish structure green color things so now understand those spikes are protein components which are very unique to corona virus alone so even if you get that one component of that protein you can create a vaccine using that and thus we've created corbi vax using the spike protein component so again you will be able to identify for example if this was corona variant 1 which had this kind of a spike protein now we know that okay fine you create a vaccine with it the only problem will happen when there are mutations happening and the spike protein's chemical composition might change then there's no point with that vaccine so corbi vax is based on the spike protein uh, the next one is this one gemcovac g e m c o v a c gemcovac <clears throat> gemcovac is again an mrna vaccine you have to understand until now when we talked about covaxin or covi shield we have not talked about any kind of mrna vaccines at this point so gemcovac is india's first home grown mrna covid 19 vaccine okay there's going to be a lot of covac vax covid all these terms so you will have to create some table sort of a mechanism i have managed to collate all the information at one point at this thing so you have gemco vac Zycovid, we already told. One more thing, Zycovid, we have formed under. I told you the National Biopharma Mission. There is a private body involved in it. That is Ahmedabad-based company called as Zydus Cadilla. Okay. one more thing because i do have a feeling about the zy covid um zy covid again uh, it is a needle free vaccine i mean if you remember all other vaccines have needle and everything zy covid is a needle free vaccine but it still applied to the skin itself okay so you don't need a needle for it you have something called as a pharma jet is something called as a pharma jet where in one bottle more <laughs> yeah thoughtful enough to give me cold water at least um yeah so zy covid is needle free but you use another mechanism whereby which you apply it to the skin itself so i can say it is first needle free plasmid dna vaccine 
but it's intradermal. Intradermal means you can give it onto the skin, but it's done using an applicator called as a pharma jet applicator. It's not a needle. It's basically like how you put certain implants, certain chips and things like that. So it's that kind of a mechanism which is there. It's called as pharma jet. Uh, now, one, one vaccine is there. We'll come back to it. So it's called as Incovac. We'll be discussing that in detail. So what all did we uh, learn till now? We've had Covaxin, Covishield, Zycovid, Zycovid, Gemcovac, Corbivax. Okay. Next. Ancovax. Ancovax, I think this can be easily detected from the name which is there. This is India's first animal vaccine against the SARS-CoV-2 virus which is there. The common belief being that see at this... Did I? One more thing guys, that Gemcovac that I discussed is specifically against the Omicron variant. Okay, it's not for the first variant, it's for the Omicron variant that came after that. Ancovax, uh, I found it interesting because of the agency that has found it. This is a vaccine created by Indian Council of Agriculture Research. It's created by ICAR and National Research Center on Equines. Okay, so they have created, this is not, you see them creating a lot of hybrid seeds and everything. Vaccine is not something that we normally think about, but then they have created the vaccines and it is the first animal vaccine against your SARS-CoV-2. You can use this on animals like dogs, lions, leopards, mice, rabbits, etc. Again, one more point over here is, here they are using the inactivated vaccine or your killed virus which is there. Non-live non -live vaccine and they are using it you for the from the Delta variant if you remember Corona had one other variant also. So from the Delta variant you have taken this component you have put it made it inactivated created the vaccine and it's used for animals. Ancovax. Covax. Covax is not a vaccine. So please don't put it under your vaccine list. Okay. Covax is a separate organization. Again, it's a grouping primarily. It's a worldwide initiative that was primarily aimed at giving equitable access to this COVID vaccines to all the countries. So you basically had your low and middle income countries which could not afford your COVID vaccines or your diagnostic tests. So, COVAX was a grouping that facilitated all of this. Okay. And here, COVAX is pro most commonly organized by three major bodies. You have GAVI, you have CEPI, which is your Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations and World Health Organizations. All of these organizations are important. In fact, from now onwards, the, the terms and the concepts that I'm bringing about Please keep it in your mind very clearly. So you have COVAX, which is a grouping like this. You have three of them coming in. CEPI, uh, your GAVI and your uh, WHO, which has formed it. Now, the next term that is important is this one. See, when COVAX got formed, COVAX got formed at the beginning of COVID times. When everybody was very confused as to what can we do or what kind of vaccines can be created. And even at that point to create the vaccines also you require so much amount of money. Right. So now obviously you cannot have the money pumped in by one particular country. But the countries they said that okay we are ready to put in money into vaccine research. Provided once the vaccine is ready we get first doses. This pricing or this financing mechanism was called as an advanced market commitment. Understand that advanced market commitment is not a very new concept. It is there, it's been there in economics for a really long time. It's a general term that is used in economics. But this term has been constantly doing the rounds these days with relation to COVID vaccination and COVID related treatments. 
So if right now they ask you a question, advanced market commitment is related to which of these aspects? It's related to your COVID vaccination. The mechanism is basically, it's a binding contract typically offered by a government or other financial entity used to guarantee a viable market for a product once it is successfully developed. So you're saying that we'll fund it, but then at the end of the day, once this gets done, you can give it to us. This we will be a good market for you. So this is the reason why. Now you also have to understand your Gamaleya, which was there, your Sputnik V, which was developed by Russia, was not created as part of this COVAX mechanism. This is also one of the reason why Gamaleya did not have a huge market once it got created. Got it? Because all the other vaccines that got created as part of this funding mechanism, your AstraZeneca, your Moderna and all had a huge market. But someday these guys, Sputnik chose not to be part of this mechanism. Again, for political reasons. Therefore, they did not have a huge market. Here, just relating those two concepts. Now, coming into that one organization that I talked about, Gavi. Gavi is what? What is the full form? Global Alliance for Vaccination. Now, here, Global Alliance for Vaccination or this Vaccination Alliance is a private, public-private global health partnership. The permanent members of it being UNICEF, WHO, World Bank and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Don't have to write all of this. I'm discussing because we just talked about it right now. UNICEF, WHO, World Bank and the Gates Foundation. This is an important one. This SEPI. SEPI was formed in 2017 specifically by the Welcome Trust, Bill and Melinda Gates, India, Norway and World Economic Forum. India is one of the founding members of this preparedness in, uh, program which is there. So this is the reason why SEPI is more important than your Gavi Alliance which is there. Now if this is clear, <coughs> this is a hmm. So in that list which we saw in COVAX, we've discussed Gavi, we've discussed uh, SEPI and we've talked about the financing mechanism. Next we come into an other kind of, this is all related to your WHO and all that, that is all what we've talked about, it's all global. This particular thing called as ACT Accelerator, A-C-T Accelerator. Huge, again, I would say if you are in your revision phase, you have to be very, very thorough with G20. G20, the current meeting, the previous meetings, when all India was, took up the presidentship of it, what all Indian innovations have happened in G20, you have to know it in and out. For sure, there will be one or two questions on G20. Okay, now in that context, again, this particular act accelerator, which is there, is a G20 initiative. And this is basically to find funding to develop, produce and give access to COVID-19 test treatment and vaccines. So accelerator, you all understand, always accelerator comes in as some sort of a funding grouping or funding mechanism. So ACT Accelerator is the G20 initiative to find funding for your COVID-19 test treatment vaccines, etc. This can, if, if they are feeling generous enough, this can come as one small question from that G20 part. But I am expecting a much more deeper question because sure India innovations, India's whatever contributions to G20, every aspect of that can be asked into a difficult one. Coming to Incovac, it was there in that list also but I had put this over here so I thought I'd discuss separately. Incovac again is Bharat Biotech's found a, a new vaccination which is there. It's the world's first intra nasal vaccine for COVID-19. Okay, it's a much, much bigger development than all the rest of the things. Ancovax, we have the vaccine for animals. Gemcovax, we had mRNA vaccine created in India. But this is the world's first intranasal. Intranasal means you apply it onto your nose part, which is there, and thus creates immunity. So here, this is an adenovirus vectored vaccine. 
Now you will be able to appreciate each of these terms. Adenovirus is what? Double stranded DNA. Vector is what? You are creating that as a vector and making it as a vaccine. Okay, in COVAC, then we come into certain disease categories. Before I go on to the disease categories, ah, after that I will discuss. Okay, again, one commonly, I wanted to do one thing right now. Now we are going to discuss several categories of diseases. We are going to talk something like emerging infectious disease. We are going to talk about neglected tropical diseases, several, several categories like this. What I want you to do is, if you are okay with drawing Venn diagrams or something, but I don't want you to be confused after that entire process, when you ask me what is the formula for this, no. I just want you, when I each and every list that I discuss, at the end, I want you to compare two lists and keep which is the common one that is coming in. So, first I will discuss your emerging infectious disease. Emerging infectious disease is an infectious disease whose incidence has increased recently in the last 20 years and could increase very well in the near future. The reason we are discussing this is because very recently your CEPI bought about a list saying that there is going to be a rise of certain diseases like your monkey pox, certain diseases like your Lassa fe fever, Chagas disease. These are all going to be emerging infectious diseases. Now the point again is, it is not a new disease. It is an infectious disease whose incidence has increased significantly in the last 20 years. If you look into the Indian context, leprosy is an emerging infectious disease in India because we had reached to a point where we had almost eliminated the incidences of leprosy. But it's doing a comeback right now. So, it differs from country to country. What would be, and this is an important thing, it's the region specific category. Then comes the next set of disease called as blueprint priority diseases. Blueprint priority diseases are primarily, see okay, you've realized that certain diseases are going to be a public health concern. Then you need to start creating vaccines for it, need to create treatment methods for it. And such diseases which we are now planning to create full-fledged treatments or cures or such things are called as blueprint priority diseases. Priority diseases are those which have the potential to cause public health emergency. And at currently at this point, there is no measure to counter it when there is a public health emergency. So you create a blueprint for how to create, I mean manage whenever this disease comes about. This is a list exclusively given by your WHO. In fact, WHO also takes the initiative to fund any kind of blueprint activity when it comes to these diseases. Okay. The common blueprint priority diseases which are right now there in the list are these. You have COVID, you have Crimean Congo fever, Ebola, Lassa, MERS, Nipah, Rift Valley fever, Zika. These are the ones which are now considered by WHO to create a blueprint to how to have countermeasures against it. Are you going to write all these names? Don't write all these names. Think of the ones that you will, you are, you are most likely to forget. Just, okay. Now coming into next category, which is neglected tropical diseases. Mm. In the case of the emerging infectious disease, we have not bothered to look at them because their cases were very less in the last 20 years. In the case of neglected tropical disease, we neglected certain diseases because all the funding, all the government policies were given to certain other diseases which were there. Now, so neglected tropical diseases are those diseases which were ignored 
and it primarily occurs in low income populations in developing regions of Africa, Asia and the Americas which is your South American region. These are caused by all these kinds of things, virus, bacteria, protozoa, parasitic worms, any of these things can be the pathogenic reasons. The most common reason why these diseases tend to be neglected despite it being in the tropical region is because in the tropical region you have the big three infectious disease, HIV, AIDS, TB and malaria. So all the funding, even if you look into India, you have entire schemes, several policies been there for TB and your malaria and everything, but not so many for the other diseases which are there. So these are your neglected tropical disease. There are a lot of their names over there, there are almost 20 I believe and India stands at the highest where India has almost 11 of these 20 declared diseases which are there. I have just noted the ones which we are more familiar with. You don't have to go into the smaller intricacies of it. Chagas disease, dengue fever, guinea worm disease, leprosy, lymphatic filariasis, rabies, trachoma, snake bite. Snake bite enervation which is there is listed as a neglected tropical disease. Got it. So again, it's because of a toxin that is happening. It's not primarily because of a pathogen that is there, but that is also in this list. Okay. Uh, just quickly, um, I'm just on the top of my head. Uh, you have, there is something called as triple drug therapy. Uh, it's used to treat which of these diseases? Triple drug therapy. It's used to treat lymphatic filariasis. It's not any reason, current affair or anything. I'm pretty sure this is like 5-6 years old, current, of, current affair at that point. But again, I take all this as very chance occurrences. Something when I'm teaching and something just randomly comes to, your, comes to my mind, I just share it with you because again, God knows. If you PC wants to pick a newspaper of 2015 or 16 and ask. So, triple drug therapy is for treating your lymphatic filariasis and you have all these. Ideally, I would say, see, when we are talking about diseases, I am not going to take up all these diseases and say, is it by bacteria, how is it spread or anything. But if you want to do it, if you want to have some insight or if you are not very familiar with these diseases which are there, at least this particular list, if you can see what is the causative organism and everything, that would be good. Next. Until now, we've talked about all the diseases which were there. So, emerging infectious disease, blueprint disease, neglected tropical disease. Now, we come on to the fighting mechanism against it. The first one being the universal immunization program. The universal immunization program, if you look as a whole, covers almost your 12 major diseases. But again, stressing on the point, nationally only nine diseases are covered which means pan india nine diseases are covered under the universal immunization program locally region specifically three diseases are covered okay so again this is a very important list you have to know what these diseases are diphtheria pertussis tetanus i already told you that dpt polio then you have measles rubella which is there Severe form of childhood TB, hepatitis B. Again, right now I have already told you two things. In previously when we were talking about the vaccines, I already told you there was an hepatitis A vaccine over there. Now I have already told you there is a hepatitis B vaccine also. Just keep this in the back of your mind because we have to talk about hepatitis a little bit in detail. Anyway, uh, apart from that you have the human hemophilus influenza type B vaccine. What type of vaccine technology is used in this? You discussed all of these. In fact, this list is where I had taken and I had seen what all vaccines are there. Hemophilus influenza. Conjugate. Conjugate vaccine. Subnationally, you have three diseases covered, which is your rotavirus diarrhea, pneumococcal pneumonia, 
and your Japanese encephalitis. I told you, rotavirus is part of your UIV program, but it is not on a national scale. It's very region specific areas where sanitation, sanitation and such clean water and all are a big issue. <clears throat> Next, pentavalent vaccine. What is the idea of a pentavalent vaccine? Yeah, so basically the idea is that in a single shot of vaccine, you can combat five diseases which are there. Pentavalent vaccine provides protection to a child from five life-threatening diseases, which are the ones diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, hep B and HIV. So DPT plus H hepatitis B and HIV. So five diseases gets covered and that is the reason why it is called as a pentavalent vaccine. Now, in uh, as part of the universal immunization program, this is the pentavalent vaccine is being provided for these kind of. So, it's a single shot, but all of these diseases will get covered. Clear? People at the back, clear? Evan Portal. The one thing that happened because of COVID, uh, I mean, there are a lot of things that happened because of COVID, but... From UPSC perspective, one thing that happened is the entire health sector has so many new, uh, what you say, innovations coming in, so many new bodies coming in. So, if when in doubt and you really don't know when was, like if they ask, most probably they won't ask year of formation or anything. But understand a lot, for example, telemedicine, there is an e Sanjeevani portal and all that has come about. We won't be discussing, it's a very simple concept and all, but a lot of innovations that have come in that aspect. Mm. Evin portal. Evin portal, be very careful here. Evin portal primarily is your electronics vaccine intelligence network. What they try to do is, on every level from national to the sub-district level, they will have correct information on how much stock of vaccine is there, how much it has reduced, which is going to get expired soon, which has to be replenished. So it's an entire network on the vaccine stock of the country. Okay. Again, to add to this, Evin Portal is relatively new. We've just finished the first phase of this program, which means India entirely is not covered by Evin Portal at this point. We've covered these states at this point, these few states, Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh. You don't have to know the names of these states. I just want you to understand, only it's not completely covered. The idea is to completely cover, but at this point, only the phase one of this networking is complete. Okay, next. Sarvavak. Again, huge question potential because of what all agencies are involved in it. Huge lifesaver vaccine to the women around the world. Let's try understanding this. Sarvavak uh, <coughs> is India's first quadrivalent human pathogen piloma virus vaccine and it is to, intended to protect women against your cervical cancer. Now understand cervical cancer is something that is caused when you have an HPV virus and the HPV virus induces cancer into the women which is there. So here you are trying to crack down on this human papilloma virus which is there. And this is the first quadrivalent human uh, HPV virus. When I'm saying quadrivalent, this vaccine is effective against four different strains of your HPV virus. Okay, so that is why it's called as quadrivalent. Again, this vaccine primarily is based on something called as or it's very similar to the idea of your hepatitis B vaccine which is there wherein you are creating something called as virus like particles. Virus like particles means as I had again mentioned you don't take the entire virus you don't even take the genetic material what you do is you take sub units of these different things and create a vaccine which is there. So this is the concept of virus like particles. It's not the virus as it is, but some units which 
seem similar to that particular strains. We have opted for a virus-like particle approach over here because we have to fight against four different strains of HPV virus. So, taking one genetic material and all will not be effective. So, you've taken units from these different different concepts and you've put together. So, what kind of vaccine would this be? You've taken from four strains, you've taken units from there and you've, someone said, conjugate vaccine. This is something that they will not mention in your news articles. This is something that uh, in, feature in the UPSC exam paper because they expect you to know these things. Okay. Now the idea is you will put this vaccine and at that specific point this HPV virus creates this one L1 protein which is there and the body uh, fights against this L1 protein and thus gets the immunity. Uh, Servavac is formed by Serum Institute of India, Department of Biotechnology and again coming into picture is your Birac. I told you we are going to keep seeing Birac throughout our current affairs. So here you have Birac again and you have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation also. Okay. Next is a concept, immune imprinting. This is something that was observed at the time of your coronavirus situation. Wherein what started happening is, see, I told you, our body is very memory based thing. So, first variant of COVID comes. Body is like, okay, fine, this is the first variant. No, body doesn't know the first variant. Body is like, okay, this is one type. It fights. Okay. It fights and after a point, so body knows, okay, when things like this are coming, similar in, uh, you know, for this protein is coming. So, we will fight against this. And the body creates antibodies against it also. Now, what happens is, COVID undergoes variation. When COVID undergoes variation, now the variation might not be very significant in its entire genetic strain. Maybe the entire other protein production and all will be very similar to the first variant. The variation might be based on how fast it is moving. Some change in the genetic code happens. But again, the problem is what? Our body, when it's again exposed to that second variant, our body doesn't know this is the second variant. Got it? For the body, it's something that is very similar to the first kind of foreign particle. Which means what? the body will generate that same kind of antibodies it generated for the first thing itself. Okay. Now, will it be effective against that second variant? No. So, what has now happened is your immune system has now become ineffective because it worked. Got it. It worked. When a foreign particle came, it generated antibodies. But the infection is not going. So, this process is the tendency of the body to repeat its immune response based on the first variant it encountered through infection or vaccination. But when it comes across a newer or slightly different variant of the same pathogen, your immune system is imprinted with that previous knowledge and it just keeps on repeating itself. Now, the problem of this is when this happens, your body is not able to crack that disease which has come in. Okay. In effect, what starts happening is the antibodies which get created in the body will be like, okay, we are, there are so many in number, but they are not, infection is not subsiding. So many and so many in number. Body will keep producing more and more and more antibodies, but still it will not be effective against that new variant. Now, this will lead to something called as cross-reactive antibodies, wherein what primarily happens is that your antibodies which have to normally function will not function and they will be increased in number. And thus, when there are so many in number and still not able to fight, the body will be going into a loop wherein it will keep on doing this because there is no way to break the loop. There is no new message coming in which says that, okay, no, this is a different variant. You please fight against it. The body keeps on producing antibodies. So, what in turn happens is, the body will get the memory that we produce so many antibodies and we still were not able to curb it. 
this is the idea of or this is the drawback of immune imprinting and we saw a lot of it happening at every stage of covid um, what you say more spread which is there now the problem over here did you ask anything okay okay now just because it's a con new concept to you how can you treat it first thing that you can do is maybe to space your vaccine shots which are there okay so for example once you take vaccine for a specific and once the entire variant has undergone change maybe there will be newer vaccine comes uh, things that come up so you space your vaccine shots instead of taking it in a gap of one or two months so your body will not have that confusion because you will have a vaccine with a newer variant which is there apart from that you can also use nasal vaccines this is the important thing why nasal vaccines why do you think nasal vaccines are a cure over here and this is the relevance of that incovac that we studied earlier why nasal vaccines very interesting concept huh tell me anyone who has any idea come on be creative science after all someone said something okay hear me out over here most of the nasal vaccines function in a manner wherein you don't see only when the foreign particle comes and enters into our body and then there is a response and everything is where this immune imprinting will happen right so you don't let it come into the blood stream when you apply nasal vaccines whatever virus gets come or whatever virus gets in this thing it gets eliminated in the first stage itself it does not wait or the body does not wait till there is an antibody full re full on reaction against it or anything which means it is proven to see that nasal vaccines happen to be more effective to stop your immune imprinting it is in this context specifically your incovac which is your world's first nasal vaccine against covid is now relevant okay again full circle so immune imprinting incovac nasal vaccine i hope all that concept is clear uh, apart from that you can also have for example uh, what you say pan sebaceous vaccines pan sebaceous means on your skin also you can have that same the idea is don't let it enter into the body stop it at the gateway itself so that your body doesn't get confused with this antibody creation got it clear 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 next one okay next concept is pheic which is a public health emergency of immediate concern okay again this list is getting important these days primarily because see um, globally if you look at it you must have also seen this happening in the time of corona wherein we all are getting affected by corona but then everyone's like who has not declared it as a pandemic who has not declared it we are like we all are dying over here why are you not declaring it which actually has a reason why because who has a system of classification wherein you can declare certain diseases as a pandemic or something based on how many people are affected how effective is the certain measures against it so on and so forth how urgent the diseases and so on based on this if the highest category is pandemic the category right below it is p h e i c don't ask me what are all the other categories you don't have to know these are the two things that you have to know at this point pandemic is there which is a very high classification below that is your public health emergency of immediate concern now it is the highest level of alert of global health body can issue but it is just one step short of a pandemic classification now understand until now your polio and your covid were there in this particular they put it into this particular list right now last year they also added monkey pox 
So currently three diseases are there in this list. Monkeypox got added because we might not have so much impact on it, but then a large majority of your European, American, and you know um, countries and all, there were very high incidences of monkeypox virus getting spread out. So they, that is why it didn't become a pandemic because we pandemic is when all of us, all the countries will have some impact. But it was a public health emergency of immediate concern. So three ones: polio. COVID and monkeypox. Now, there are three criteria which is there, which is fulfilled, which has to be fulfilled if you are putting something under your uh, PHEIC category. And first thing is serious, sudden, unusual or unexpected. The disease should have been serious, sudden, unusual or unexpected. It should carry implications for the public health beyond a state's national border. That means if just one country is affected, you cannot have it as a PHEIC. Third condition which is there is there is no immediate treatment methods available in all of these categories also. In, you have to satisfy any of these categories itself, you can categorize it as a PHE IC. And once that is over, you will remove it from that category also. It will not remain there constantly. Okay. Now, if any disease or such kind of any, um, um, what you say, pathogenic diseases are there, and if WHO has, be, has to be alerted, in our national level, it will be alerted by this particular body. So NCDC, which is your national center for your disease control, they will be the ones who will be taking a number of, okay, how many people are affected by this and intimating it to the WHO so that they can put a particular disease or not just India, they will be, each country has certain agencies which are there. Based on the number, they can classify it into whatever category that is there. So... <clears throat> few of the things that I want to clarify over here, the National Center for Disease Control comes under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. It is the nodal agency for the disease surveillance of communicable diseases. Okay, and it also functions as the national, as a national center for excellence for devising treatment methods against these diseases also. So, communicable diseases is a catch over here. Okay. Only for those diseases, they will be intimating the information to the WHO. Okay, this is one other uh, two-pronged question thing that I am expecting. Already, you, rem you all remember last year there was a question on Aishman Bharat Yojana. And the question was not a simple question. It was not just asking which ministry it was or anything. It was a detailed question. So, in that aspect about a government health scheme, if they want to look into, this is this, I mean, this I do feel could be a question potential. There are two concepts over here. Just get this right. There are two things. There is something called as an integrated disease surveillance program. This is the first one. And you also have a newer version called as integrated health information platform. The comparison is between these both bodies. Okay. Integrated Disease Surveillance Program is an older version, okay, that is your IDSP and your I Integrated Health Information Platform is the newer version which is there. The functionality of it is very similar but they have undergone certain changes. So maybe we will compare both of this in study, that would be a better thing. Initially, we have the disease surveillance program. So obviously, what would be happening in the disease surveillance? You're going on checking about how many or what all diseases are currently doing the rounds, how many people are affected, should we categorize it as an epidemic, should we not re relay this information to some other body, all of these things are checked in disease surveillance. You're constantly keeping a check of what diseases are affected by or what people are, what diseases are getting, you know, imprint on the people out there. So, this is a program that was launched by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare with World Bank assistance way back in 2004. And to conduct this program, 
this is i do not know how many of you have seen this but uh, in a no, no, normal what you say town areas and all sometimes they'll come to your home and they'll come and especially when there's an outbreak like for example there is a chicken gunia out, outbreak or a dengue outbreak they'll come they'll ask is anyone sick is anyone having any the, any of these symptoms it has you know they come and check these things if the state has a good health infrastructure system they do this now what happens over here is you have something called as a central disease surveillance unit and you also have a state surveillance unit in each particular state under the state surveillance unit you have several people who can go and get or in each district you have bodies which will go and collect this information so you do realize this is not a completely digital program or anything you have people going and collecting the information people adding it into the computer and then it becomes digital over here got it so understand your integrated disease surveillance program started way back in year 2004 is not a completely digital program is having a lot of manpower being used in it will primarily look into the propagation of 13 disease conditions which are there okay the most common 13 diseases that happen in india at various seasons we have dengue typhoid all of these diseases which are there they focus on epidemic and zoonotic diseases zoonotic means what ha huh? tell hmm. hmm. you have an animal transmission part it can be animal to human animal to an other animal any of these categories would be your zoonotic diseases so this is all being checked under your integrated disease surveillance program now obviously with all this digital india happening we feel this is not too cool for us and thus we have integrated health information platform integrated health information platform is a completely digital platform that is now looking on to replace your disease surveillance program how so why because when you go to any of your public health center or your government hospitals which is there you will see either if you have an aadhar or something that is there you will have that mention you will have the doctor putting your uh, whatever disease or anything he'll be directly adding it into a data portal which is there you will get a prescription and all that but it is already been put into what you say informations like this apart from this the covin portal that we have already created is now being diversified to collect information about other epidemics also so in this manner you are looking forward to replace your disease surveillance program with your integrated health information platform and this one will cover 33 major diseases okay so the key difference is being this is completely digital 33 major diseases and it will integrate data from various sources it can be real time data it can be your it can be even an asha worker that comes about or anything whatever data they are filling it into the forms all of that will be put into a digital mode which is there it's completely digital i do feel this will be a comparative both of this is under the ministry of health and family welfare this is relatively new start i believe it is in the 2020 period which it has started <sighs> feeling sleepy guys huh if anything i would be like there's so much of information coming in because this is all how for how many of you guys this is like new information or all of the others it is uh, like i heard this this is nothing for me huh? nice okay rare diseases now again you must be thinking all of these diseases in the first place are itself rare but no we have a separate category called as rare diseases which we or uh, your health authorities identify who defines rare diseases as lifelong disease or disorder with a prevalence of one or less per 100 population one or less means not 0.5 the idea is it is very less that means that is the range at which this disease will 
occur. Now, ideally, this would not have been a cause of concern for us. But again, India has gone on to create a national policy for the specific category of diseases. That is why it is important for us. Okay. So, rare diseases, this is the WHO classification. India has defined like we have huge this thing and all. So, we cannot take 1000 people population. For us, rare diseases, one in 2500 individuals. So, again, totally different things. Globally, it's one or per less per thousand. Here, it's 2500. We have a national policy for rare diseases being created. Now, one more point is that it's not a new current affair thing, but these things. See, there is a scheme called as your Umid program. Okay, Umid program is primarily for those hereditary diseases or for those extremely rare diseases which were there where we had to find out new methods. You don't have to look like, for example, different variant of sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is normally there, but maybe a sub variant of sickle cell anemia maybe a thalassemia disease which is there. So, all of these used to be categorized under something called as your Umid program because Umid would take care of what all methods we can develop under this. Under the Umid program, they've created something called as Nidan Kendras. Okay. Don't look at me like I created all of this. Okay. This is... <laughs> I am just telling you that some people are like, my God, there is no end to all this. But you have the Umid program. Under the Umid program, you have the Nidan Kendras. And the Nidan Kendras, what they do is, because obviously this is a very rare phenomena. You cannot be like, okay, how many of you have this disease and so many people raise their hands. So what happens is through these Nidan Kendras, whenever there is any, for example, someone goes to a primary health center and the doctor notices all these symptoms and they feel this is going to be categorized under a rare disease, they will give the case to these Nidan Kendras. Obviously, the doctor will do the treatment, but the Nidan Kendras will be intimated on this knowledge which is there. Okay, there is this person. In this manner, we will be able to collect information on people who have these rare diseases. So, the Nidan Kendra is under the Umid program, collect data for the rare diseases and it's a very important part in our national policy for rare diseases which is there. Policy that is it, policy part, the most factual information you needed and the important one is this much. Now moving on to antimicrobial diseases. Antimicrobial diseases, I didn't teach you CAR T cell immunotherapy, right? Yeah, I have to teach you. That. Okay, before I go even into antimicrobial, a uh, few more other points. Um, okay. Um, elimination and eradication. What is the difference? If you have thought both of them are same, this is the day you break that idea. There is elimination of disease and eradication of disease. What is the difference? And so, what is eradication? She's saying just the opposite. Someone said something very similar. There are three terms that you have to understand. There is something called as control. There is something called as elimination. There is something called as eradication. You have to be. What happened? Okay. You have three terms. You have control, you have elimination, you have eradication. The order is in this exact manner. Okay. So, what is the idea of each of this? Is control means that, see, for example, in a certain area, dengue is spreading. At this point, you take measures to control the spread from human to human. But that doesn't mean that the disease will not come back or anything. You are just at that particular point, somehow creating mechanisms so that the disease doesn't get spread. If you've noticed, when rains, the monsoon begins, you see in a lot of places, they go and spray things, they go and cut out weeds and everything. The reason why they do it is that if the dengue cases are rising, you need to somehow eliminate the mosquitoes and everything over there. That is why you control the disease. Now, Elimination is a step ahead of this. 
elimination primarily means that you are not or you are trying to take that disease and prevent its occurrence as it is which means on several levels you're trying to control it so much so that the disease does not come back into that specific region now that specific region can be something as small as a district and something as large as a country got it so when you say you eliminated a disease or india has eliminated a disease it primarily means that in specific sense go all these areas you have somehow controlled the disease in such a manner that the occurrence of that disease will not happen got it so this is your elimination eradication is way ahead than that eradication means that see even if you have eliminated something at the worst probability there is a chance of that thing maybe coming back okay why because there's a lot especially now in the case we have eliminated polio but whenever our neighboring countries ha are having a polio outbreak we take absolute necessary precautions why because we can get or this disease can take a come back into our area so elimination always has that small risk eradication means you do not have that pathogenic strain of whatever that disease is being caused by anywhere out in the open you might have it in labs again so if, if i'm saying smallpox is eradicated it means it's a global thing it is eradicated from almost all the corners but you might have smallpox strains maybe in the lab conditions which are there but smallpox strain in the lab is not having that disease causing potential got it so eradication is the broader sense I want you to be very careful because i've seen a lot of um, um, current affair materials newspapers use these terms in a very wrong manner okay so now let me ask you which in in the indian context at this point which are the diseases that we have eliminated i already told you that say something new polio okay anything else if something has been eradicated in the entire globe we would have also eliminated it right so smallpox okay now there are uh, tell you three more diseases three more diseases that we have eliminated at this point we have an ongoing program where we want to eliminate it by 2025 so maybe hopefully we have the program but <laughs> elimination clearly means see obviously again one or two cases that is not the point that is being there or very minimal cases that is not the point when you eliminate a disease the idea is that disease the entire transmission of it on a geographical scale will be severely curtailed we have a program for polio that is a polio vaccination which is happening we are not having a we have a tb elimination program we have a measles elimination leprosy elimination program so your clue is it's none of those diseases when which is the next disease okay not so famous then there's a disease called as yos which is a bacterial infection this is something we have eliminated mm. <coughs> then there is another disease but it is not a disease that is um, commonly seen in humans but we have again managed to eliminate it it's called as rinder pest it affects your animals we've managed to eliminate it but again it is not seen in humans one more disease which is your neonatal tetanus not your full tetanus just neonatal tetanus neonatal means the tetanus that occurs in a very newborn child which is maybe in the less than 20 days or time even that we have managed to eliminate it we also have a program the common ones that i just mentioned leprosy measles and all that we also have a program to eliminate trachoma which is there okay i'm just on the top of my mind because trachoma was part of one of the lists that we discussed which was the list was it neglected tropical was it emerging infectious which list it was part of one list 
you know as a uiv right yeah uiv so again this top of my head trachoma is a disease that causes blindness in children okay Just keep that in mind again see all these extra points that i am telling is that you, it's practically impossible to teach every other science and tech aspect in this six, this thing so you take the clues maybe use it to eliminate now coming into this particular concept which is there called as your uh, anti microbial resistance again i do feel you guys might be more experts than me in this anti microbial resistance or anti microbial diseases wherein what happens is a certain microorganism that could have been earlier easily killed by certain drugs have now become resistant against it so microorganisms resistance to anti microbial drug that was once able to treat its infection is called as your anti microbial disease if you notice over here there are lot of reasons why this can happen lots of reasons i want you to maybe after uh, again this is something that you should ideally do also once your class today is over i just want you to take the last 5 years upsc questions and just solve your health biotech related questions see how well you can solve it okay so again you will come across this topic of amr try solving that question and reach out to me tomorrow because i really want to know how many of you solved it right now the point over here being this anti microbial resistance can be caused when you are overusing misusing and improperly using certain uh what you say drugs i have written a point over there for example taking antibiotics to treat viral disease which brings to my question for what do you use antibiotics for bacterial infection so this point just be careful will antibiotics ever work against virus it will work but that is why people use it no there you are seeing people are using now what will it work uh, get this clear in your head because i don't know because they have already asked one layer of questions of amr they can go into the deeper level when he says it will work against virus what actually is happening is the virus is not getting killed using that drug what is getting killed is or what is getting controlled is the virus when it enters into our body will cause certain infection and inflammation in certain parts when you take an antibiotic it reduces those inflammation and thus we feel a little bit better but it does not kill those viruses why why is virus and why is antibiotics not effective against virus we for us that is like the first thing when we have something we like give me antibiotics why is it not effective against virus why only against bacteria <laughs> this is primarily to do with the nature of what bacteria and what virus is okay understand this <clears throat> okay anything any other basic nature okay i'll tell you this ha huh? cell division okay somewhere related to all that like i'll tell you this okay when you take antibiotics what happens suppose you have a bacterial infection when you take antibiotics ideally what happens in your body it's a drug okay it's a medicine that you're taking in now understand bacteria as a group of microorganisms have a lot of as i already told you in the beginning what happens is bacteria has its own life cycle their bacteria is like okay today i'm going to divide i will have a cell wall around me i have all of these things wherein i will be creating so which means that if any of these things get cancelled i can kill off the bacteria okay the antibiotics i am taking will prevent this cell wall creation of this bacteria leave the cell wall now even if the cell wall 
got formed. Bacteria is decided today I will be taking in nutrition, I will be doing this activity. Maybe the antibiotics I am taking will be going and affecting the metabolic pathway of that bacteria. Which means bacteria as it is, think of bacteria as this very organized, disciplined person who has all these metabolic pathways, antibiotics comes in, you can ruin any of those practices, it will be, bacteria will be like fine, I am done. But virus is an organism which does not have any clear metabolic pathways. Virus is just carefree. Here I am not living. I will enter into a human body. I might take some living. This I might get living. I don't have a specific agenda today. I might propagate. Got it. So I am telling this to you in simple terms so that it will be there in your mind. But understand the metabolic pathways in a virus is not clearly defined. Which means if I am taking an antibiotics also, where will it go and act on? Got it. It will not act on, you see, I'm taking an antibiotic specifically that says that will not allow this bacteria to create the cell wall or the, you know, the cell wall formation is there. Now, some viruses will not have the cell wall. Some viruses which are there will not have, for example, if the metabolic pathway is, you will go and affect the bacterial nutrition which is there. Virus will be like, okay, I don't, I, I might not have a pathway for this thing. The idea being, viruses are those organisms wherein their pathways are not defined, their metabolic activities are not defined. They vary from organism to organism. Vi bacteria, if you take, if I'm taking Streptococcus, which is a group of bacteria, they will have very similar pathways also. Which means if I create one antibiotic, it will work against a lot of these strep bacteria which is there. But here, in one COVID itself, you are having so many different variants. So that is also the reason why antibiotics generally do not work against viruses. Is that clear? So you can take it if you want. But if you take it in excess, what is going to happen? You will keep on taking this and this will lead to your antimicrobial resistance. Next thing is uh, greater access to over-the-counter antibiotic drugs in developing countries that we easily go and we know all the medicines. Give me amoxicillin, give me that. You will just go and get it over the counter when you don't even have doctors to see. It might be something very small. It might just be the weather changed. You're having a slight bit of cold, but then you're like, I want antibiotics. So again, because over-the-counter use is possible, using broad spectrum antibiotics very important point. This is the point based on which there was the question asked. Understand the implication of this. See, <clears throat> there are two types of antibiotics. Broad spectrum antibiotics, narrow spectrum antibiotics. Narrow spectrum are those ones which are given specifically for a category and are very, very effective. Broad spectrum are the ones that I just told you. Like for example, streptococcus. For all of them, there is one antibiotic. Now, the problem over here is that when you use and broad spectrum ones are more cheaper, more easily available for narrow spectrum, you will require most of the time the doctor's prescription. So, what you will do is more easily accessible is your broad spectrum antibiotics. Broad spectrum, but the problem is what? You are eating that antibiotics not against streptococcus 1 or 2. You are having it against a lot of different sub bacteria or sub families of bacteria that come against it. Out of it, when you keep having broad spectrum antibiotics, these bacteria as a group itself will start getting resistant against it. Now, the application of this is what the question was. Understand when people get old and when they have a lot of diseases like um, heart disease, kidney, liver, different things are going wrong in their body, mostly seen in old age. At that point, you cannot, because one thing is you're becoming old, your body's immune system and everything is actually downplaying a bit. On top of it, you cannot give narrow spectrum antibiotics for each and every problem. Why? Because the body of the old person will not have enough of metabolism to actually fight against each of these things. So doctors normally what they do is, they might be having heart disease and lung and every other thing. They instead of giving narrow spectrum, they might give them broad spectrum antibiotics. Which leads 
you will see that whenever you see antimicrobial resistance you have older people more susceptible to this kind of a thing because they are the ones most commonly using your broad spectrum antibiotics clear so now when you try solving that question this is the logic that had to go behind it <clears throat> then dumping of inadequately treated effluents from the pharmaceutical industry we have a current affair that deals with it but understand when you deal give out certain from the pharmaceutical industry some uh, things which are there what are you doing you are basically exposing that thing to all the microorganisms which are there in the air and water and all of them are like hey this is that one i know i have i'm persistent against this one so on continued exposure of such pharmaceutical drugs you will get again the bacteria will get resistant antibiotic use in livestock feed at low doses for growth promotion in industrialized countries again you feed this is the reason why people keep on mentioning about when you have chicken you shouldn't have the broiler chicken the reason being that you have a lot of antibiotics being used for the livestock and the livestock we consume and thus we our body also starts becoming resistant resistant against these microbes finally then poor sanitation and hygiene that are generally there it's a common point that is there now okay um this is not a uh, two year uh, current affair it's quite previous to that but the concept is important even now the concept the idea is called as melacidins and melacidins is a new class of antibiotics which are there the speciality of these antibiotics is that it is capable of killing antibiotic resistant pathogens so you have to understand by now a lot of your pathogens have become resistant against a lot of drugs your tb certain uh, what you say uh, drugs that is used to treat tuberculosis yeah that is now falling under you these organisms are resistant against it lot of such drugs have come under this list so now you need methods to either kill off these resistant or i have what you say extremely resistant pathogens or find new methods to somehow control them killing off solution has this new category of thing called as melacidins melacidins is capable of killing off several antibiotic resistant pathogens it's produced by microorganisms living in the soil and dirt so normally ground parts it's extracted from that capable of killing your uh, amr resistant pathogens <laughs> few of the measures that india has taken against amr is india has put yeah. it's not that too it can be yeah it will be mostly bacteria because we are using antibiotics against it but then you have virus you have proven cases of fungi all of this can have imr uh, what you say resistance against it yeah schedule h1 drugs measures taken against amr in india first one is schedule h1 drugs again we have created you know there is a national list for essential medicines and everything there we have created a separate category called as your schedule h1 drugs and those schedule h1 drugs cannot be sold without a doctor's prescription most of the time it doesn't get followed but understand schedule h1 drugs is given as a category to curtail your antimicrobial resistance and you need a doctor's prescription for schedule h1 drugs this is the first thing second thing is your red line campaign again you know that uh, at on certain drug formulations you will have a red line being drawn and if a red line is there on the drug it means that you need a doctor's prescription for it this is again your red line campaign next is it prohibited the manufacture sale and distribution of colistin what is colistin i'm hearing growth growth what are you saying after growth promoter okay you also said the same thing okay hmm. 
colistin is a commonly used growth hormone formulation or growth you can call it growth promoter and very recently again as i told you these effluents and everything which is there it actually there are two parts it promotes growth but it also fights against a lot of your bacterial infections okay and it is normally given into your cattle and your livestock and everything but again the problem being because it is part of these livestock and cattle when we consume it it is getting transmitted into our food chain also so right now the the manufacture sale and distribution of colistin has been curtailed and they are now finding effective substitutes for it okay next one tb tb is an i have i put some drug names over here primarily because tb is a very important topic okay um already the basic questions regarding it have already been uh, maxed out by upsc we are going into the leveled up version here tb is a disease that is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and primarily you have to understand tb was or could be treated originally by these four different kinds of drug formulations there is something called as inh there is a rifampicin there is a pyrazinamide and there is a ethambutanol i just again don't buy hard these names understand what has happened at each stage there were these four drugs that we could use but now what has happened is again i told you the tb variant is getting drug resistant so first you had an mdr tb that is occurring that is a multi drug resistant tb this kind of tb occurs when the patient does not respond to your inh or your rifampicin okay which means at that point at least the other two are available you can use it but then you have a much more severe variant which is your xdr tb and in the case of xdr tb they are extensively drug resistant against all your tb drugs which means at this particular point if tb has to be treated you have to look into other different different methods thus enters into this particular vaccine formulation which is there called as your pretomanid not vaccine sorry drug formulation your pretomanid right now pretomanid is that kind of a drug that works against both your mdr tb and your xdr tb so this is now the key factor in a lot of your tb treatment processes i don't want you to remember all of the other names i at least want you to remember pretomanid is related to treating xdr and mdr tb at this point now apart from that we have a lot of uh, different methods which we have at this point where in national strategic plan against tb elimination we've had this from 2017 to or this plan is from 2017 to 2025 it's based on a detect treat prevent build platform okay so at each stage what all we can do they have been trying to control tb in this manner i picked out some of the things which i feel are question worthy in each of these stages for the first thing here you have detect treat prevent build they've created a tb surveillance system called as nixe also remember nixe nixe mitra nixe kendra all of that is related to your tb control okay so it's the tb surveillance system so what do the tb surveillance system do again just like a disease surveillance they're going on and checking how many people are affected by what then right now again one more thing you have to understand when you originally had tb you had certain symptomatic things and all and you had certain tests to find out what um t i know if you are having tb or not and the very weird nature of tb as a disease is tb most of the time occurs in combination with another disease okay you might have tb and pneumonia tb and typhoid so you will not know if this is tb alone which is there this is one of the reasons why tb treatment gets extremely delayed 
okay so now in this case to significant this is already there it's a problem of the tb as a disease on top of it now imagine the doctor thinks it's tb and they giving the drugs and then if what if you have the mdr tb or you the xdr tb you will not react to that drug but the doctor again will not know okay if you are having tb or not to counter this pro problem is where you have the specific test called cb nat okay so if they give you an line probe assay or a cb nat test it's both used to detect your mdr and xdr tb okay specifically to detect mdr xdr tb okay not against stressing on the fact this is not for your general run of the mill tb you are not going to use this you are going to use it for the advanced versions for the beginning stages you have an other test called as your true nat test so in the beginning stages if you want to detect any kind of tb you will use the true nat test and you might have an early diagnosis but again the true nat test is not a very um what would i say reliable test not a reliable test this is the if obviously the true nat test was really good we would be detecting tb on the go right but that is not happening here but understand true nat is also related to tb cb nat and line assay probe is also related to tb <laughs> And apart from that, you have something called as your isoniazid preventive therapy, which is used to treat TB. Whenever someone is being detected with TB, you start giving certain drugs like your pretonamide, which is there, and you also have a therapy which is iso IPT, which is there. Remember again, if they give it all these terms, I have just put in here so that you get familiarized with these terms and you know it's related to TB because obviously in the options there is going to be malaria and leprosy also doing its rounds. Got it? Because these are all the elimination things we are planning right now. We also have the BCG vaccine. Most of us get this as we are kids at this point where initial stages it is being seen that to prevent uh, the TB infection in children up to a certain age, BCG is effective. But again, it is not a long lasting solution which is there. <sighs> Malaria. Okay, malaria. Malaria is uh, commonly caused by this group of protozoans called as your plasmodium. Now, till here we all know just the fact that there are five common variants of plasmodium. Okay, malaria in India is caused only by four of those variants. So, you don't have to know all the four names. I'm just saying there is a category called as Plasmodium no less K-N-O-W-L-E-S-I. Plasmodium no less -E doesn't cause malaria in India. Okay. All the other one which is Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, all these other four variants cause malaria in India. So, remember... Totally five variants of Plasmodium, four of them cause malaria in India. Uh, again, you know this very well. You have the protozoan which is there. The protozoan is carried in by a vector which is your female Anopheles mosquito. The female Anopheles mosquito takes the vector into a body, into a bloodstream. From the bloodstream, it will go into the liver which is there. In the liver, it will propagate and maybe stay dormant for a really long time and then maybe come out in some form which is there. So, understand... Malaria is starts with plasmodium, carried through anaphylis, moving into the liver part and from there is where the damage starts. Then, it's both preventable as well as curable. Now, coming into this, until now, see, we've been trying to cure it or prevent it through a lot of control measures which are there. 
right now in the world there is a very effective vaccine against malaria and that vaccine is called as your muscurix vaccine muscurix vaccine has another term it is rts vaccine also so if you see rts also understand it's muscurix okay muscurix vaccine is specifically created against plasmodium falciparum and plasmodium falciparum is a leading cause of malaria malaria in india but we have not yet licensed it in india okay which means you don't have that vaccine right now there it's a global medic global vaccine which is there important point we have not licensed it here it's against plasmodium falciparum which causes malaria in india <clears throat> okay before i go into national vector bond thing let me just deal with uh, the hep hepatitis virus now i just want you to um <laughs> i just uh, see you have primarily five different types of hepatitis a b c d e we have already discussed as in hepatitis a we've talked about a vaccination we talked about hep b also there is a vaccination for hep c there is no vaccination just so keep that point in mind what happened it is curable yes it is curable if you give proper body fluids and everything it can be curable but there is no vaccination found at this particular point one more thing hepatitis b and c you can be exposed to any of your body fluids hepatitis d you will have to be exposed to infected infected blood alone got it in the case of hepatitis b and c it can be any of the other blood body fluids it can be semen it can be blood it can be any of the other things which are there but in the case of hepatitis d hep d it is with infected blood can i normally tell this as a uh, <laughs> I don't know in 2017, not 2018, 19 or 20. Again, I just mentioned this casually, and in that year it came as a question. So from that onwards, I have made it a ritual to talk about it in the class, so that God knows from where the question can come. So this much about hepatitis. Now moving on to the next topic, you have something called as a National Vector Bond Disease Control Program, which is quite different. from your ncdc the other one was a national center for control of diseases for communicable diseases here the important point is it's vector borne disease wherein you have a carrier taking the disease so here you have malaria dengue lymphatic filariasis scala azar je chikungunya these many diseases are tried to study they are under the vector borne control program what they try to do is they detect the presence of these diseases they try to break the pathway from where the disease is there and it gets transmitted into humans most of the time it would be uh, through the mosquitoes which are there so they try to control the disease in this manner they try to control the vector and thus these lists this 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 major diseases are covered under your national vector bond control program pharma bodies of india very especially since uh, corona has happened this is one area that is important can you all do you know what are the major pharma bodies in india good see let's put it like this in india pharmaceutical products have two major aspects one is your commercial sale related to it and the other part is the pricing and certain aspects related to it so let's try to put it into two categories you have one called one major grouping called as your ntpa national pharma pricing authority and the other one is your cdsco 
सेंट्रल ड्रग्स सेंट्रल ड्रग्स स्टैंडर्ड कंट्रोल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एंड कैन यू प्लीज चेक द दिस थिंग फुल फॉर्म ऑफ इट सेंट्रल ड्रग स्टैंडर्ड कंट्रोल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन सी सो द टू एस्पेक्ट ऑफ इट कम फ्रॉम द फैक्ट दैट अ ड्रग इन इंडिया नीड टू बी मैन्युफैक्चर नीड टू बी प्रोड्यूस्ड इन बल्क द प्राइसिंग हैज टू बी डिटर्मिन इट हैज टू कम इन टू द मार्केट एंड फ्रॉम द मार्केट इट हैज टू बी सोल्ड ऑफ टू पीपल एंड एट दैट स्पेसिफिक पॉइंट इट शुड बी अवेलेबल टू एवरी वन after all this process you are creating a drug which is 4000 rupees for one specific dose means it is not going to be suited for this country's needs so you have two of these organizations national pharma pricing authority and cdso doing separate category of functions the first one which is your national pharma pricing control body comes under the ministry of chemicals fert and fertilizers your cdsco comes under ministry of health and family welfare this is the first thing now based on this the national pharma pricing uh, pricing authority which is there they give out a document called as your drug price control order very confusing terms because the drug and everything until now it seemed under this but then here it's the national pharma pricing authority they give a category or they give an order every time which says that okay these many drugs in india are now produced this will be at this particular pricing and this particular pricing takes into consideration your essential commodities act so they are trying to ensure that your drugs are all available okay essential drugs are all available in one thing then coming into your this side here you have an other list called as national list of essential medicines the difference between these two be your national guys at the back any doubts I'm constantly hearing someone talk like is there any doubt 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 ha huh? no right okay okay now coming to the second thing which i was talking about your national list of essential medicines what is the difference between both your drug pricing control order what they do is they don't check if something is essential or not what they do is they'll give out an order they'll be like okay this drug will be sold at this price it is a very formal document which does not take into consideration lot of these factors the reason being that the same drug pricing control order will also be the base price when we are exporting these drugs also got it so at that point you cannot have lot of medicines being sold at very very cheap prices got it but your national list of essential medicines keeps in mind the consumer so here what they do is amongst so all the drugs price will be listed some drugs will be put under your national list of essential medicines and they will say for these medicines the price will be cut short by a large number got it so understand for me i normally always think of this as a much more consumer oriented organization and this as a more manufacturer oriented organization why because or manufacturer group of things because here they are trying to favor when you put out the drug pricing control order you should price it at a way where it is not um, bad for the manufacturer also he should also be incentivized so this is what happens and the reason why i said it is a essential commodities act means that all the drugs that are produced in india would primarily come under your essential commodities act so the drug pricing control order is published from the essential commodities act 
that is an obvious thing if we are in government we will know that very clearly why being because all the drugs come under essential commodities so the drug pricing control order is given as per it and prices are determined here you have a national list of essential medicines now one more thing to be noted is you have in this you have this person or body called as your directorate or drug controller general of india he actually is the one who has the head or who will be the authority to determine what all medicines we can put under this list what will be the range of the pricing etc got it so these are the pharma bodies in india i expect you to have a clear understanding because I've seen a lot of cases mm, one more thing mm. currently in our national list of essential medicines we have over um, this number we'll have to clarify okay i'm um, just putting a number here it's 851 medicines and four major devices like your pacemakers and everything four devices and 851 drugs we will you just i don't it's not very important but you understood the range of number it's not 10 20 or anything it's a large number of drugs that are put under your national list of essential medicines so with that we move on to the next topic again this topic would not have been important at all but our cough syrup killed a lot of kids in gambia and thus these two components which are there diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol both have become important from the upsc aspect again understand <clears throat> diethylene glycol or ethylene glycol both of them were used as adulterants in these cough syrups now they could be used as adulterants because they were sweet tasting colorless odorless liquids which were there okay so this is why they could be easily mixed with your cough syrups but the point here being both of these components you look at the areas where they are used and this is if upsc wants to ask i don't think upsc will ask a question too much on to the um the disaster which it created but at least on to these components which are there so here you will see ethylene glycol is used in the production of polyester fibers paints and your pet which is your polyethylene terephthalate okay it's used to create plastic based substances the diethylene glycol on the other hand is used as a brake fluid it's used to create cigarettes treatment of paper etc okay so to create the softness of paper so again both of these were used in highly industrial applications and then was used as a uh, drug adulterant in your cough syrups what happened got it can i change the slide this drug again it's for the very first time that like we always say you know what what is the highest thing that you know to cure cancer is such a high goal that most of the scientists have practically this is the drug that has now has evidence that it has cured cancer okay so in us you had patients who had rectal cancer they were administered the specific drug which is your dostarlimab and it was seen to cure the cancer completely okay so it's a i would say again uh the evidence now supports the fact that you had certain factors along with it but the drug used was primarily this right now who is now considering what were the conditions under it and if proven right this would be used as a major drug in your cancer treatment protocol what i want you to keep a note of is one obviously it completely cured cancer in patients all that but this is a monoclonal antibody drug 
monoclonal antibody what is basically a monoclonal antibody antibody again you understand it's something good for our body you get it monoclonal antibody basically means that see when you have cancer cells i told you cancer cells are not these new type of cells or anything it will be our cells only but in an uncontrolled level of production so at that point the can be clear identifiers as to what cancer cells are okay so cancer cells might secrete some specific because their genetic code has changed no obviously because the genetic code has changed they are producing in a large number and because they produce in large number there might be some kind of protein or something that gets secreted from them your monoclonal antibody what they try to do is the our immune system create certain antibodies which will go and attach itself specifically to these cancerous cells see ideally you know what in when when someone gets affected by cancer the problem where our body cannot fight against this is because our body cannot differentiate it's the same cell you will not have so many differences between a cancer cell and your normal human cell which is there but you can create certain bodies called as monoclonal antibodies which can go and detect these minute differences between a human cell and the cancer cell bind against it and destroy this particular cancer cell it is in this context this is called as a monoclonal antibody drug this is primarily used in immunotherapy at this point i want to take you back to car tel car t cell therapy but that i believe is like the third or fourth slide it will take some time to go back till then so i will just keep in mind i will be taking it at the end of the class just remember when we talk about car t cell therapy what we are primarily going to study is about this kind of antibodies that go and bind against certain proteins okay okay now again the dostarlimab was a monoclonal antibody drug which means that when you take this drug it will induce the production of these antibodies and they can go and attach against your cancer specific cells next one health huh? one health joint plan of action again uh, there are several variants of it that you are seeing it's called as one health approach one health one world plan the crux of it is all the same thing itself the idea is after your covid has happened the world entirely saw okay a lot of our systems are getting affected all together when there is a disaster like this so right now these organizations fao unep and who along with world organization for animal health have created a five year global plan that focuses on what each country should be doing so it is as part of this one health one joint plan of action where right now if you see how many times did i mention the term disease surveillance to you i told you about tb surveillance for malaria there is another surveillance system there is an integrated disease surveillance system now we are creating these bodies because in this joint plan of action they have mentioned that all the countries who are part of it should ideally start creating disease surveillance systems got it so the idea is you come together if at all there is the onset of another pandemic we have to create what you say curtail it at the go itself so you cre create surveillance system you create data centers which will store it you create vaccine discovery programs for it all these are sub parts under this joint plan of action this is the reason why for most of the schemes that we discussed in the beginning you would see who funding you would see maybe your world animal health funding the reason being this is all being done as part of your joint plan of action so again i hope that has come to a full circle because all these elements that we see get derived from this joint plan of action that is there okay anti retroviral therapy can you tell me at this point something about this therapy without knowing anything about it as it, as it is talking about retrovirus do we know what retrovirus is 
yes so here you have antiretroviral viral therapy which is the therapy that is primarily used to again to be very clear with the word it does not cure aids it controls aids okay so this is the therapy that controls your aids and why is it anti retroviral therapy so now you also know something about the human immunodeficiency virus the human immunodeficiency virus is a retrovirus which means it will be having a single stranded dna and now you are having this therapy that is going to work against this particular virus you don't see this is a um, if you know there is something called as a 90 by 90 90 strategy again if you hear that also it is related to aids control in india to ensure that 90 percentage of the uh, people who have aids get detected by the system out of that 90 percentage get anti anti retroviral therapy this is that 90 90 90 program again that is also related to aids control <clears throat> what happens in the case of aids what is the problem or how does it become such a lethal dangerous disease okay that is a valid point but initially what is happening so you have this virus yes what it primarily does is i told you you have the white blood cells the white blood cell is the one that is dealing with all the immunity in the body so here what happens is the human immunodeficiency virus they will come inside they'll stay for some time they will start attacking your white blood cells in the first place specific kind of white blood cells called as cd4 it's a type what happened what's the doubt okay specific kind of white blood cells called as cd4 which is a t cell now you know the problem what will happen if the t cell gets affected there is no b cell or antibody after it so at the crux of it it gets affected and this creates this entire system where our body immune system is affected and then as he said once the immune system is affected you start being susceptible to lot of infections one major infection being your tb got it so again if tb cannot be detected then here in the case of your hiv patients what gets detected is tb and you don't detect your hiv first got it <sighs> priority pathogens list okay who has started this new system wherein they are giving out a list what happened sure you are like mm, <laughs> what happened any doubt any doubt or you are like when will she stop this is that the question we will stop it very soon don't worry just think about it you guys don't have to go and read another current affair material you don't have to look into any other source to keep on revising this your snt current affairs of this particular areas are sorted so you can bear with me for some more time don't worry <laughs> okay your priority pathogens list so who has started this new system wherein they select certain pathogens now it can already they have published a list for bacteria In 2019, they published a list of bacteria. This year, they have published a list of all the fungal infections or the fungus, which are the ones which are severely, uh, what you say, prioritized. As in, like they are the ones which might cause more infections, which are there. So again, understand they have currently published this list for bacteria and now for fungus, not for anyone else, not for any other microorganism. Uh, and here few of the common or few of the ones that worth mentioning are there was something called as a candida oris fungi in this list now someone had asked me some time earlier right is antimicrobial resistance only for who why do people who ask questions disappear after that someone sitting here right 
okay fine anyway uh, someone had asked if antimicrobial resistance gets it's only bacteria or anything but this candida auris is a highly drug resistant fungi which is there okay which is an outcome of all this antimicrobial resistance so they have put this in this particular pathogens list they have also put this one mucorrhels we all know this at the time of covid there was this outbreak of black fungus and it was seen like a side disease that came along with your covid so even that one is also put under the list of fungal pathogens the problem is we put the list and all it just so happens that right now only four classes of anti fungal medicines are available got it so unlike your bacteria or virus here you don't have many medicines if at all there is an outbreak that comes about so now you do realize why they put a list out for it so that you can start working on the anti fungal medicines okay um one minute one minute just give me a minute okay three four slides yeah four four slides simple okay before i forget i have to um, tell you another current affair which is there it's not basically your uh, okay i'll tell you after carbon dating but yeah right now just remember commonly in your news there has been the rounds of a lot of these things antioxidants uh, polyphenols etc i just wanted to get familiarized with these common nutrients which are there first one is called as polyphenols it looks like some very dangerous chemical but it is actually micronutrients that we get through plant based foods okay so get yeah, don't make it's just go through you don't have to learn too many concepts here next one is certain antioxidants so again in the beginning of our class he had mentioned about oxidants wherein oxidants are the reason why our body undergoes uh, decay any particle undergoes decay so to combat oxidants what do you need antioxidants so antioxidants are substances that can prevent or slow damage to cells caused by free radicals they are otherwise called as free radical scavengers so what are these free radicals the free radicals are the one which are roaming around and saying like okay oxygen come and give company to me at this point antioxidants will be like free radicals so now free radical is not there to go and have a combination with your oxygen then comes into the concept of beta carotene beta carotene is what yeah carrot did i hear carrot or oh, someone say that okay fine uh, <laughs> i'm hungry also so i might hear food items uh, <laughs> beta carotene is basically understand mm, in your colored vegetables which are there your beetroots your carrots in all of these things you have a certain component called as beta carotene beta carotene is gets converted into vitamin a so i wanted to keep this in mind and this is very important beta carotene as it is is not a vitamin okay it creates vitamin a which prevents night blindness and certain diseases which are there so if someone says beta carotene is a vitamin that is wrong but beta carotene is an antioxidant okay at the worst case where upsc is obsessed with antioxidants this year all this can be an information in one single question before i go into this this is the one that we have to deal with lycopene okay understand see in these particular carotene products that i mentioned carrot beetroot tomato all your colored items which are there you have this component called as lycopene okay the reason now understand it's a phytochemical phytochemical means a chemical that occurs in the plant the reason why these things get color and all is due to beta carotene we established that but this lycopene which is inside these colored fruits and vegetables is a product which has extremely high commercial value okay commercial value in the sense that to use 
for several coloring items for several food items you can extract your lycopene into these things to create antioxidant drugs you can use this lycopene so which means this is this has huge commercial value but it very so often is not easily identifiable so what has happened over here is in india the institute of nano science and technology have now developed a biosensor a nano biosensor which can go and detect lycopene from your uh, fruits and vegetables and plants thereby allowing us to extract it okay i am saying this not it will never come as an individual question it might come as one statement of a larger question based on antioxidants because one of the biggest use of lycopene is in creating your antioxidant drugs and antioxidant therapies etc okay okay now since that is clear anti radiation pills again this year uh, this year no last year you all know in ukraine region there was the case of a nuclear disaster bound to happen at that point it was said that you had to supply anti radiation pills to the population which is there so what is primarily your anti radiation pills these are potassium iodide tablets which are there okay now what is the advantage of potassium iodide see understand when there is a radiation disaster and you have iod what you say a large majority of all these radiation things that is there what happens is you have in our body this organ called as your thyroid okay now what the thyroid does is it takes in these radiations and the radiations in a very simple manner what happens is most of it will have iodine and everything in it this thyroid's primary function is to collect iodine break it down for the body normally normally in our body that is what iodine uh, thyroid is doing but that is not radiation level iodine small levels of iodine we get from salt this is the reason why people who have thyroid issues have a lot of issues related to their balance and everything the reason being that this iodine production is what is getting or the iodine collection is what is getting affected anyway coming back to our topic what happens is when we are exposed to radiation one of the organs that first gets affected is your thyroid okay wherein these radiations are taken in and this iodine gets stored in our thyroid now this iodine when it gets stored in our this thing this is of radiation quality from our thyroid whatever is the track where it goes into our body it will start spreading and we will be affected by it so your anti radiation pills what they do is when you get to know itself there is a radiation you supply your body with potassium iodide pills meaning your thyroid will already get stored with iodine so whatever iodine that comes from outside will not be stored in your thyroid that is the idea of anti radiation pills you are not preventing radiation or anything your body will still get exposed to iodine it's just that the gland which can store iodine will already be now filled with the potassium iodide component which is there clear okay oh one thing uh when when i talk to you about cloning the reason why i even uh picked one of those i mean there are a lot of reasons statically it's an important part but other than that china very recently cloned an arctic fox and it was a very successful cloning okay so that was also there in news i mean just giving you information not that will come as a question obviously we are not going to say the laurels of china in our upsc but still no an arctic fox has now been cloned okay coming to the zeno transplantation which is there zeno transplantation is the idea wherein zeno obviously now you know something that is external it's any procedure that involves the transplantation there is no genetic modification or anything over here transplantation or implantation or infusion of live cells or tissues or organs from a non human animal source non human animal source or 
a human body fluid or extra wherein what happens is you are taking the non-human one placing it into the human one. So very recently uh, they have done this experiment wherein they have taken few organs from the pig they have created or they have transplanted uh, I believe it was heart but the patient yeah and the patient didn't leave for much primarily because obviously there is a lot of it's in the experimental stage okay but understand the the, diff, the thing is zero transplantation primarily involves organs tissues live cells or anything from a non-human source that is the catch non-human source into a human body okay it is normally considered as something very like therapeutic wherein for example uh, someone's organs have completely gone damaged you need a quick replacement so you do experiments of that sort it's therapeutic for certain diseases like neurodegenerative diseases diabetes etc where human materials are not commonly or easily available Coming to the last, I'm um, not last, second last topic of the day because we have CAR T cell therapy to be done. Um, okay, coming to your carbon dating. Uh, the reason why carbon dating becomes the very important topic is this year is how many of you have heard about this particular? Heard? Fossil. What is the speciality? Fossil. This is what? In three statement question, first statement, fossil. Cool. Okay. Oldest living animal. Second point. Third point. What is the third point? Can India. India. Where in India? Bimbetka. Bimbetka. It was found in... Now you all understand, no? Where your current affairs preparation fossil, you know, <laughs> some part related to one of you knew. Bimbetka, none of you know. That is the importance. This is important because of that. Okay, when I'm saying oldest living animal, how old do you think this is? Or what? I have a problem with a this thing uh, years. That is why I have written it down somewhere. Wait. Five fifty million year old. Now this is one line of a current affair. Now when this current affair happened, a lot of discussions were they were talking about carbon dating. Not because they used carbon dating over here. They did not use carbon dating. They were like, we cannot use carbon dating. And they were going on saying, why we cannot use carbon dating. So, these are the important things. And now we are going to discuss about carbon dating. Carbon dating primarily stems from the fact that you have an element called carbon. Carbon is basically isotopic in nature because carbon, there are several components of carbon which will have the same atomic number but the number of neutrons in your carbon will be different. So based on that you have a carbon 12, you have a carbon 14 etc. Carbon 14 is the one that is known to be radioactive and it decays at a well known rate. And this well-known rate is determined by this concept called as half-life. Okay, understand half-life as a concept means that you have a certain quantity of something. How much time will it take to decompose to half that quantity? Which means if I have 100 grams and something got divided into half, okay, it turned into 50. Then that's 50 grams, how much time it will take into divide into further half. This is what determines something's half-life. Understand the most, if you look globe or totally also, your carbon 14 is a very rare occurrence. Carbon 12 is the more abundant one, which is then. Carbon 14 is radioactive, it is not something that is quite. This, okay, in your slides that I shared with you, is this completely there in your slides? 
Is anyone referring with the slides? Okay, wait. It's all right. It's all right. Come to carbon dating first, and then it's fine. Okay. So the problem over here is, see, when something dies off, okay, and obviously all matter which is there, all living matter, will have carbon in it. Carbon once it gets into a dead form, or once it becomes an organic matter which is there you will start seeing the presence of in all of us there is carbon 14 just understand it's not so much there in level but once this decay starts to happen because this is radioactive in nature you can easily find out the age of something by measuring the carbon 14 component in it why because carbon 14 has a half life of almost 5736 some years Okay, which means the quantity of carbon will reduce by that according to these many years. It's a long half life. Okay, so now what would happen is if something is old up till almost 40,000 to 50,000 years, you can determine the age using your carbon dating. Beyond that, what is the problem? Carbon will not be there. This is having, it is getting, see, yeah, half life means it is not like it will be there for infinite amount of time. At one point, it will reduce to minuscule amounts where we will not be able to detect it in a good manner. This is the reason why anything beyond your 50,000 years of age, you cannot use carbon dating for it. This is the first thing. Second thing, you cannot use carbon dating for your non-living substances also because carbon is where carbon is there in organic material. Non-living substances do not have carbon present in it. So you cannot determine your age using your carbon dating. Now, what was missing over here is there were two more techniques which were there. Just give me a moment. One was the plutonium lead method of dating where again what would happen is you have plutonium constantly and these kind of materials constantly being degraded into your lead and those kind of things. So again it's radioactive nature. Measuring the lead also will help us determine the age. One more method was there. I'll tell it to you tomorrow. You guys know, is what it argon? I'm just getting argon in my mind. Anyway, leave it. Don't don't fill your mind with any wrong information. I'll tell you the other dating technique tomorrow. Okay. So this is much about carbon dating. Now, quickly let's go into your car T cell therapy and uh, get it done with. cell therapy. Mm, the crux of it lies from the fact that something is there happening with respect to your T cells. What is happening with respect to your C T cells? See again understand that whenever you have as I had already mentioned to you whenever you have uh, any kind of cancer we already talked about monoclonal antibodies so the crux of it being there is some kind of protein that is being released. Now, in the case of your CAR T cell therapy, what primarily happens is, see, you need to train your body to identify your cancer cells. Okay. Now, it can, one method is what I told you earlier. You put a monoclonal drug which is there, which will go and target. 
and other method is wherein you take the some amount of T cells of your body. So you extract it from our body. What you do over here is you create something called as a chimeric antigen receptor. That is from where the car name comes. Chimeric antigen receptor. What is the idea of a chimeric antigen receptor? Think of it like this. You have cancer cells being formed which are very similar to the human cells or normal cells which are there. But there is a small difference in the fact that maybe these cancer cells which are there have small amounts of protrusions of something like this. Okay, small amount of some kind of protrusions which are there. This our body cannot easily identify. But we have seen this, we have identified it. So what you do is, you take the T cells outside and these T cells, what you do is, you try to fix or for example, these are all things that are shaped in a certain manner. You create a genetic code which will create some changes on these T cells. Now, if your T cell normally, what is happening is, would, any doubt till now? Is there any point? Because, you know, it's very annoying when I'm talking and there's a background noise constantly going. Not getting pissed because, you know, it's the drag end of the class. But please, hmm? uh, this is the problem. Loose flow. Okay. So, what happens is, you have cancer cells which somewhat look like this. Your normal T cell is very normal, seemingly looking like this. But what you do is, you induce certain things, you induce a gene into your T cell, which will lead it to creating some kind of structure like this. Now, the point is what? This is a structure that which can go and bind to those cancer cells. Okay. So here what you've done is you've taken the T cells, you've changed their genetic composition and based on the genetic compositions now they have these chimeric antigen receptors. You grow millions of such cells in the lab and you infuse it back to the patient. Now when you infuse it back to the patient, these T cells will not go anywhere else. It will go directly to these cancer cells and attach themselves over to these cancer cells. And thereby the T cell which was earlier not equipped to go and find out which was the cancer cell. Through this modification it has now detected it and you can easily once the obviously once the T cell finds out this is the culprit, it will eliminate it. Okay. So this method is called as immunotherapy where you're using your own immune cells training them having genetic modifications in them to fight against your uh, certain pathogens which are there it's a cell-based gene therapy since your live cells are re-engineered into doing this it's otherwise called as your living drugs got it so, with this, your areas of, or I would say, let's put it like this. Obviously, when you look into your current affair materials, if you still plan to do it, you will find lots of other crap out there. Okay. Now, it's your call. Do you want to waste the rest 30 days going on reading things that have very less probability of coming? Or try to focus on something that is quite revision oriented. Now, you have to keep revising. Even to revise this, all those COVID vaccines itself, if you have to stay in your mind, you have to revise it at least twice daily. So, uh, make a wise call over here for your parts of biotech, health, public health and um, general science biology. It is complete. Tomorrow we will be dealing with space, ICT, rest of the parts which are there. It will also be in this manner. You will have your static portion with your current affairs. Is this fine? Okay. Fine. You can leave right now.